Kiefer's a guy who's doing his part to talk about why he thinks that games are art and gush over things that are near to our hearts. So let's select a game and press start. I'm sorry. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the world was still reeling from another mass destabilizing event, the Reagan administration. The most humiliating moment of the Reagan administration was the exposure of the Iran-Contra affair in 1986, wherein senior officials were selling arms to the embargoed Republic of Iran. The sale of these weapons were used to fund the far-right terrorist group known as the Contras, who were waging war against the left-wing Sandinistan government in Nicaragua. Though the administration was ultimately exposed for their actions, the investigation conducted by Ronald Reagan appointees concluded that there was no evidence that Ronald Reagan committed any illegal activities. And though 11 people were ultimately convicted, their cases were either dismissed or they were eventually pardoned by President George H.W. Bush, who was vice president during the affair. The Reagan administration got away with attempting to destabilize Nicaragua with no consequences. Which is unsurprising, as the administration was never held accountable for destabilizing America either. The strategic implementation of tough-on-crime laws after a sudden crack epidemic that primarily impacted black communities led to a disproportionate murder and imprisonment of black Americans. Multiple investigations were conducted to determine if the CIA was involved in trafficking cocaine for the Contras, but predictably, nobody has been held accountable. Additionally, the Reagan administration's apathy to the AIDS pandemic led to the death of hundreds of thousands, primarily within the LGBTQ, Black, and Latin American communities. Furthermore, Ronald Reagan's direct firing of nearly 12,000 striking air traffic controllers was a devastating blow to the organized labor movement, kickstarting the death of the American middle class. The consequences of the Reagan presidency have been trickling down for the past several decades. And, while not as directly devastating as his aforementioned atrocities, Ronald Reagan is also responsible for how Americans consume media today. In addition to the repealing of the Fairness Doctrine, his FCC also rolled back their established policies that limited advertising to children. Children's TV couldn't be used to sell products to kids, but under Reagan, the lines between entertainment and the commercial began to blur. TV shows based on licensed properties would quickly flood the airwaves, whether it was about Rubik's Cubes or even video game properties like Pac-Man, Super Mario, or Legend of Zelda. New properties such as Transformers and G.I. Joe and He-Man were created specifically to sell toys to kids, with storylines crafted to introduce new characters and accessories. Cartoons became synonymous with advertising, and these properties became a lifestyle brand a substitute for culture. While certainly manipulative to advertise to impressionable children, many of these properties have endured for decades and would come to be widely beloved by audiences of all ages. But just because products mean a lot to people doesn't mean they were made with the best intentions. Some things seem great on the surface, but hide something sinister underneath. And with Ronald Reagan, there's always more than meets the eye. Like many Reagan-era policies, a domino effect of damage was created. Deregulating TV may have created beloved pop cultural mainstays, but it further commodified art. Advertising no longer sponsors entertainment, it is entertainment. Congress attempted to intervene with a bill that limited direct advertising to kids, but Reagan vetoed it in November of 1988, near the very end of his presidency. Reagan's deregulation of television rippled into the film industry with an influx of product-oriented movies. One such example includes the 1986 film The Transformers the Movie, which ended up failing commercially. But a much more successful and shameless example stands out, the 1989 film The Wizard. The film was panned by critics as a shameless feature-length commercial for Nintendo products, but was a modest financial success, grossing $14 million against a budget of $6 million. Perhaps because this was the only way for American audiences to get a sneak peek at the most anticipated video game ever at the time, Super Mario Bros. 3. After Reagan left office, some very basic regulations were reinstated at the FCC, but the culture of consumption never truly went away. In fact, it ingratiated itself in our culture. The brand synergy by entertainment giants like Disney now speak for themselves, with their dedicated Disney Channel that uses its commercial breaks to solely advertise Disney products and content. But more concerning is the ramp up of the military entertainment complex in the years following Reagan's deregulation. Top Gun, a 1986 action film, was made in collaboration with the Department of Defense, and rehabilitated the image of the Navy in the minds of Americans following the Vietnam War. It's become common practice in the years since for Hollywood films to incorporate military storylines and imagery to get DoD backing. Whether it's in Michael Bay's Transformers or the Marvel Cinematic Universe flick Captain Marvel, the military entertainment complex has rooted itself in what we consume. I say all this not to shame or scold people who consume it, but to point out the absurdity of our consumption habits and what brought us to this. Just because Disney takes military money to manufacture consent for proxy wars doesn't mean I think you're evil for liking Spider-Man. But people were willing to endure a terrible movie like The Wizard just for a few minutes of Mario 3 footage. We can't trust the owners of the properties we love to use them responsibly. 
and the systems that protected the Reagan administration are still in place. He didn't just deregulate the media to make corporate influence stronger. He did it to make all right-wing influence stronger. I'm Kiefer, and this is Select and Start. Welcome back to Select and Start, the podcast where we talk about meaningful and memorable video games. I am joined today once again by a good friend of mine. He is one of the hosts of a great video game podcast called Fine Time. Please welcome to the show, Dre. Dre, how are you doing today? Doing great. Glad to be here. I'm happy to have you here. I think this has been sort of a long time coming. I enjoy the Fine Time podcast and uh, we'll talk about games and all things Mario in a moment. But first, uh, please introduce yourself to the listeners who don't have the pleasure of knowing you and tell them what you do and what you like. Okay, well, I'm Dre. As you know, lots of people call me Andre. Some people call me Dre. Only if you're cool. If you're cool, you call me Dre. Yeah, I don't know, man. I love video games since I can remember. I don't do much except that. That's always my big hobby. I love old stuff. I love new stuff. I do a podcast as uh, Keith. Can I call you Keith? Is that weird? That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, as, as he said, I, I do a podcast called Fine Time. That's kind of my main thing right now uh you can follow me on twitter for my weird tweets pizza dinosaur if you really like to um but yeah i'm just i'm just a video game dude i'm a good old video game dude that's all there is to me well there's no one more gatekeepy than the gaming community so we're gonna have to check your <laughs> credentials here uh so tell us a little bit about your relationship with gaming your sort of history with it what specific games you enjoy playing and you know maybe cap it with what you've been playing lately oh my history with it i I've been playing arcade games since I've had conscious thought. My very first memory is playing Galaga, like standing on a folding chair, like up to the arcade machine to play it. Mm -hmm. Like that's how far back that goes. Like most people my age, which is 40. Oh, my God. Uh, the uh, <laughs> My first console was an NES. I got it for my fourth birthday. So it'd be May 86. Right. And I remember being floored by this. Because I had no concept of playing video games at home. So I remember someone hooking up to my TV, probably a dad or whatever, and being like, oh, you know, you can play video games on this. I'm like, well, where do you put in the quarter? I was so concerned about the quarter. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> you don't have to put in a quarter. You don't have to put in a quarter. I was like floored. <laughs> I, it was the best thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> anyway, so like, yeah, I was always a Nintendo kid growing up, as you could probably imagine. Jeez, what was my first not Nintendo? Probably a PS1, I guess. Probably my first not Nintendo thing. From there, yeah, just your typical video game life. Always I had a I had a personal falling out with Nintendo. I think from like uh 2008 to like 2016-ish. I didn't play any Nintendo stuff. I was gone, baby. Doesn't sound like I missed much anyway. But <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I love all the games. I've always been an arcade person first and foremost, so I think that's the, probably the thing to know most about me. If you want to know my tastes, it's that I grew up in the arcades. That is that was my first love more than playing games at home. Always going out, playing the newest and hottest machines was it for me. Right on. And I kind of want to probe a bit on the, the, the 2008 to 2016 falling out with Nintendo. They seem to be a company that more often than the other big two uh, console giants, probably have more arcadey type games out. I, I don't know, actually. I think the Xbox Live Arcade generation kind of, you know, helped the indie game thing. Uh, all right. So a little bit. Let me, let, let, let's just refine the question a bit. What what was your falling out with Nintendo like? I During that Wii era, they just started making decisions that I just thought were awful, to, to say the least. It was creeping up all through the 2000s, like when the Game Boy Advance and GameCube era started. Nintendo of America particularly made really weird localization choices. I thought we just started not getting a lot of stuff here, but then we did like we were the only I think like what Advance Wars only came out here, right? Then even come out in Japan till they have like a two pack or whatever. We got that. But then like, I don't know, Europe and Japan get Doshin the giant and we don't. I don't know. It was like <laughs> weird stuff like that. It was just like all the all these little things, right? Building up over time, over time, whatever. And I feel like we in particular, I like the system, by the way. I'm not going to call it a gimmick factory or like, you know, the we detractors like to do. I don't feel that way about it. Right. But I think it's very clear that the best stuff that came out for that system was like the first two years of its life when that stuff was supposed to come out on GameCube. Whether it's like Super Paper Mario 
probably Mario Galaxy at that rate. Twilight Princess obviously was on both. I think there was that Donkey Kong racing game that was supposed to use the bongos and then it came out on Wii and I'm like, well, now it doesn't use the bongos anymore. You got to use the Wii, you know, the nunchuck. And it's like, well, I have these stupid bongos. Just let me, <laughs> let me, let me. But besides that, all those little nagging things, by the end of the 2000s, I just really feel like they were creatively bankrupt. I don't know what, came, I mean, like there was Super Mario Galaxy 2, I guess, that I really enjoyed. I don't even want to get started with like Skyward Sword or like, you know what I mean? Like I was I was just hitting disappointment after disappointment. I think what really set me off, I guess, even before Wii U was the announcement of 3DS. Well, it's like it's the DS and now it's 3D and then you have and then we all know how the launch of, you know, the first couple of years of that went. Right. So I'm like, I'm out. So I just I just spent like a good six, seven, eight years just not playing Nintendo games for one reason or another. There's all a bunch of little things, not just one thing pissed me off. But do you think that sort of sort of the emergence of the Internet age and social media sort of made you more aware of what those problems were on a structural level and sort of broke an illusion for you? Because you said it was kind of a long time coming. Um, sort of, kind of. I also think my tastes were changing a bit in the sense that like I was also pretty disillusioned with like that triple A gaming space that ramped up real hard. Like when the PS3 and 360 got going, those right. are not games for me. You know what I mean? I'd rather do a lot of things and play like Gears of War. There's nothing wrong with that stuff. I'm not dissing it. That is just not for me. Like I am just not going to sit around being playing, you know, Assassin's Creed during those times. My solace was Nintendo and I wasn't getting a whole lot of that either. I spent a lot more time playing TurboGrafx-16 and TurboGrafx CD like virtual console games more than I ever spent playing Wii games or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So that was just, I dove into that hidey hole. I'm sorry, yeah. I hope I answered your question correctly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you, you did elaborate a bit on it. So what were you playing uh, specifically when you had your disillusionment era with Nintendo? What did you sort of go to? I went back to the 360, which I already had, and I because I hadn't really been playing. So I'm like, I don't want to play these stupid games. And then I realized that, hey, there's a lot out here, especially like you said, I'm glad you mentioned Xbox Live Arcade earlier and the indie stuff, because that's kind of where I went for a while. Around that time, also, I got a new laptop, so it allowed me to I, this is the first time I started using Steam stuff like that. So I started mm-hmm. playing indie games there, even just going back and playing you know, old Dooms or Heretic or Hexen or, you know, those those 90s FPS that I like that are very sure. arcadey. So, of course, I like them. Not the I was very, very upset with the way the first person shooter genre rent the Call of Duty and the, I just no thank you. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I kind of dove into those kind of games some more. Like I said, a lot of indie stuff, Xbox Live Arcade. And then I realized, hey, you know, there's a lot more stuff on Xbox 360 that I might like to play than I originally thought. But yeah, I just dove into that. I never had a PS3. That's probably, I think that's the only PlayStation I've ever owned. Let me think. Yep, that's the only one. So, oh, you know what? Also, I just remembered. I also got a PSP in like 2009, like pretty late into the game there. So I also dove into that library and started playing that stuff. So I guess that's where I went. This is sort of a recurring bit that happens and I'm not perpetuating, but it just seems to happen where everybody who I've had on the show has like sort of either missed out on the PlayStation 3 or only had it for a little bit. So I, I, <laughs> I like the PlayStation 3. It's it's I, I understand why people sort of went to uh, the Xbox 360 because it initially had a better offering and that Xbox Live Arcade, our Xbox Live Arcade really did change uh, our attitudes about video games and open it up to an audience and uh, groups of developers that didn't have an opportunity before. Oh, so, yeah. So, so sort of to put the conversation back to Nintendo a little bit, the, your timeline sort of works back to the Switch sort of grabbing you back or that era of it. What, what, mm-hmm. what brought you back? Okay, this is weird, <laughs> but okay. yeah. I started playing Miitomo. You remember Miitomo? Or the, yes. the app? Yeah. I really liked Miitomo. I don't, I couldn't tell you why. Everyone <laughs> tried to shit on it, right? Because I was like, I don't know. I like this game, you know? And then it, then it got shut down and I was kind of sad. But I started <laughs> playing that. And then I started buying a couple of Amiibo. I never had a Wii U or mm. even a 3DS. I, I finally got a 3DS for Black Friday 
in like 2016 because it was like a hundred dollars or whatever you get a new 3ds anyway you love going like to handhelds yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i just went right there you know catch up on some <laughs> stuff that i hadn't played a couple phoenix rights uh, you know a mario and luigi here or there whatever and then I started hearing about, you know, what at the time was called the NX, of course, the, what would become the Switch. And I was thinking to myself, if this thing is actually what it's advertised and Nintendo gets their shit together enough to actually put out games and not whatever has been happening the last four years on Wii U, this is going to be the best. The absolute best. And then I'm sure you remember in October 2016, they had that first teaser trailer showing the switch. The guy, you know, playing at home, goes to the park, playing on the airplane, Skyrim, whatever. Blew my mind. It's perfect. Especially, you know, what did it for me when he was sitting on the plane? He was playing. He had the two joy cons in his hand Mm -hmm. and sitting there. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is perfect for me. This is Dunchuck and Wiimote, but without the cord. This is great. And that's how I always play switch. Like when I'm at yeah. home, I hold I, I like the two joy cons. I use a pro controller, too, of course. But like that was the best when they illustrated that to me. Very concise, clear concept. It, it blew my mind. And then, of course, the January 2017 presentation put it over the top for me. So I was back. I was fully back. I went to business school. Not a lot of people know this about me initially, but I, I did. I uh, studied marketing. And I actually did a project on the Nintendo Switch because I found that advertising campaign to be fascinating. There's that background redemption arc going on with Nintendo after sort of a confusing branding with the Wii U and making a console that is desirable and versatile and offering a selection of games for it. I thought that that was just a really compelling thing to make a project on. So I, I agree with you that the that they really found something there. And I mean, it speaks for itself. It's now one of the best selling consoles ever. And it's yeah. uh, about to outsell the PlayStation 4, which was also a massive, massive success. That's success. so incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. What have you been playing lately then? Uh, these last couple weeks, I've been playing the Overwatch 2 beta. I'm an Overwatch okay. person. I I love that game. And I'm... And, I'm not really a online shooty, shooty, bang, bang person. Obviously, Overwatch is different from that. It, that's what drew me to it. The characters, whatever. I'm actually not even a Blizzard person. Before Overwatch was coming out, I made fun of the art so hard. I saw Winston with his like bubbly like space. I'm like, what is this like fantasy star online bullshit? I love PSO, actually. So I, I was just I was <laughs> like, what is this, man? I don't get it. But I, anyway, so I became an Overwatch person. I've been playing the Overwatch 2 beta. I've been enjoying that. I actually started playing something because of you. I don't think I told you this yet. You had some you had some errant tweet about, I don't know, maybe about a month ago now when like PlayStation Plus, the current system went live Mm -hmm. and you were saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, I meant to play Jack and Dax here for a couple minutes. I played for three hours. Oops. Or whatever. (laughs) And I was like, oh, yeah, I never did really play that game because I had it on Vita and the port was so bad. I couldn't I couldn't finish it. I started playing here now on PS5, you, you know, using PlayStation Plus. I loved it. Mm. I loved Jack and it was great. It was a great game. Eight to ten hours, just a great little platformer. Then I played Jack 2 and I boy, I hate it. Now I, I this <laughs> afternoon, I just started playing Jack 3 and I'm like, you know, I may as well just finish it. Screw You're it. it I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to kill Praxis. I love the shit out of Jack and Daxter, especially the first game, because that was the one that I grew up on. I didn't come to the future games until I was a a teenager. I think that that first game is really something. It's very strategic, actually. Naughty Dog Mm -hmm. developing a game that takes a lot of the sensibilities of the visual sensibilities of Legend of Zelda, but putting that in the Mario type platforming space and then creating a sort of challenge for themselves by creating an open world that doesn't have any loading screens it's great and i i'm I'm glad that you played it. i had no idea that you played it on a on my recommendation yeah kind of like well i mean i was always interested but you know i bought the wrong version before so it's but you yeah you put that seed in my head it's like oh yeah i need to play that and you're right i actually agree with you i always say i don't like 3d platformers i like mario you know because i feel like mario gets right what almost all of them get, I don't want to say get wrong. That sounds a little harsh. I'm not saying I don't like any of the 3D platformers, but you know what I'm trying to say. Like Mario does a thing and everyone's just playing for a second. Jack yeah. and Daxter really nails it. Like you, you, I mean, the open world, like design, no loading. It runs at 60 frames a second. Yeah, it's 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 a technical marvel. It's it's incredible. And it, it's designed so smartly where you just lead, you really earn those uh, precursor stones or whatever you're collecting, right? So it's it's a great design and a great game. 
I enjoyed it. I do think in a lot of ways we are still catching up to that early batch of PlayStation 2 era games. I've been thinking about Jack and Daxter and how advanced it felt and how groundbreaking it felt to enter that into a new generation. And I've also been thinking about Metal Gear Solid 2 in that context because in addition to the way that it pushed storytelling forward in video games, there's just a lot of like technological beats in that game that still aren't standard in the AAA space, like the ability to shoot wine glasses off the wall and then shoot an ice an ice bucket and then shoot the individual ice cubes that fall out of the ice bucket. Yep. Uh, but no, I mean, you talking about it on the Fine Time podcast uh, is actually going to prompt this next question, first of all. But I loved your enthusiasm for it because it's a, a game that is over 20 years old and it still has like that sort of new feeling to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just not a whole lot like it even at the time and before or since, really, I guess, because, you know, to reiterate what I said on there, I think a lot of games are of that type are built where it looks like here's a bunch of platforms in midair and here's a like there's nothing wrong with looking like an obstacle course, you know, Mm -hmm. like and I think I use the example that Super Mario 3D World looks like an obstacle course, but that works because it's like a linear thing and you want that sort of Mario, you know, acrobatic Mario sort of thing, right? Like it works, right? But if you play like, I don't know, tie the Tasmanian tiger and you have like all these like, you know, just doodads laying around and it's like, well, this is what a platformer looks like. Right. And it's like, no, that's why I don't know, 80 percent of that genre. I just just really can't get into Jack and Daxter was an exception because that game is exceptional. Yeah, it is head and shoulders above so many platformers. And that brought me to my next question, which I came up with based off that uh, conversation you had on the Fine Time podcast. Obviously, Mario's number one. Mario's number one in the platformer world. Like you said, everybody's just playing for seconds. Who do you think is winning second place right now in that in that space? I don't even know. Is anyone even? My first inclination is to say Sonic, even though it's not true. I'm just a sick Sonic person that way, and I can never let Sonic go. Doesn't matter Mm -hmm. how many times they treat me so poorly, I cannot stop. I wish I knew how to quit you. You're too slow. I yes, I am looking forward to Sonic Frontiers. Yes, I feel like a clown. Yes, I I, I just I cannot stop with the Sonic. <laughs> um, you just talked uh, about the platforms thing, and that is like super guilty of the platforms thing you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's weird, but it's like I can't I can't let it go. But mm. Sonic has the pizzazz, right? Because like mm. it has the spectacle. That was the great things about the uh, Sonic Adventure games is that the spectacle was so high that it almost yeah. didn't matter. I'm OK with style over substance sometimes. Like everyone says that it's a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing. If you go if you make that style really, really, really insane, I'm OK with it. So like, you know, if Sonic can do that for me again, I guess I guess it could be second. Maybe maybe Sonic Frontiers would uh would suffice but outside of that no i don't think there's anyone in that space right now that would that would fit i mean everything is sort of like becoming a hybridization of things too so there are things that are taking platforming elements and then put it into an action adventure space or a first person uh, space like the doom eternal does a lot Mm -hmm. of platforming but obviously it's a shooter and violent simulator first yes The Hollow Knight games and Metroidvanias in general will use platforming as a navigational tool, but those are exploration games. Because even Jack and Daxter, that that first game, incredible, but it moves away from that because it is sort of following that trend that emerged after uh, Grand Theft Auto 3 released to do the uh, open world gritty violence thing. Yeah, in open world games from that era are not for me. I just that kind of like and it's like that's the reason why I didn't like Jack, too. Besides, well, there's a lot of reasons. But number one reason, every single mission in that game is so annoying. It's not even everyone talks about the difficulty of it. It's not even because it's like harder and fair sometimes or whatever. They're just not fun to do. As so many escort missions, so many racing missions, mini games where you have to press the PlayStation button symbol. It's just every single one is bad to me. (laughs) It's just not a single one that's fun. Really thinking about it, I can think of like games that are like one and done amazing platformers. Celeste is one I can think of. Cuphead. I really like Celeste. Yeah. I mean, I guess Cuphead is also, again, one of those like hybrid genres where it's also a, uh, a two player Contra type game. But that strikes out to me. But a series, like the, the, like you said, the instinct is to go with Sonic, but Sonic has a lot of duds, so many duds. Yeah, especially lately. What was the last, like, 
you know, actual console Sonic game that's not Sonic Mania, Sonic Forces, that was, ugh, I didn't like that at all. So just, <laughs> and that was getting to be five years ago now. At the very least, I know this is like a crap, the crappiest silver lining of all time, but at least they're not like shitting out a Sonic game every year now like they used to. Remember, they had yeah. like Sonic and the Secret Ring, Sonic and the Black Knight, Sonic Unleashed, Sonic, you know, Shadow of the Head. Like every year there was like one crappy game. At least they're not doing that. So maybe it gives me a little more hope for Sonic Frontiers that they're not just spamming the marketplace. We'll see. I, I legitimately will see if it's a quality quantity issue or if it's a uh, not them not knowing what to do with the intellectual property. I think it's a bit of both. I, I think outsourcing, you know, the brand has been super helpful for a lot of companies lately. They did it for the new TMNT Shredder game. That's not a Konami developed game. They say just like somebody asked Konami who wasn't doing anything with it, like, hey, can we? Yeah. OK, cool. And then yeah. something great happens. Shredder's Revenge is incredible. And I be going into that game. I am a fan of tribute games. I mm. love their games. I, Mercenary Kings is one of my might be my favorite indie game of all time. Seriously, like I love that game. Panzer mm. Paladin, Flint Hook. They make so much great stuff that I love that just hits me. Um, you've probably heard if you listen to Fine Time, you've probably heard me talk about the like fact that I just think a lot of indie developers get the retro stuff wrong. Maybe it's because I'm old and I played this real quote unquote real stuff or whatever it may be. Right. But there mm. are people who get it right. And Tribute Games does. So uh, Shredder's Revenge is just tip top. It might be the best game I played this year so far. Honestly, I'm happy to hear that. I, I'm looking forward to playing it. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I'm, I'm going to play it because people have been talking it up. I love the Ninja Turtles as a kid. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do actually want to play it. Yeah, it's it's great stuff. It pulls from all the different sources of turtle. You know what I mean? I'm obviously familiar yeah. with the original stuff from back in, you know, when I was that young. So but it pulls from that from Turtles in Time from the it feels like it pulls from the early 2000s stuff as well, which I'm a lot less familiar with. But it feels like there's something for every type of turtle fan there. Yeah. So I thought about this some more about the platformer thing. I was sort of buying time so I could think on this a little bit. And I do think there is a second place, or at least there are some strong contenders in the, in the genre, but you have to go back in time a bit before you just get to one-off indie games like Shovel Knight. And it's Sly Cooper for me, I think, which again, mm. kind of stealth hybrid genre. Same thing with like Ratchet and Clank, where it's a platforming shooter game. Yeah, But those are, those are strong games, and I do think that they are first and foremost platformer games. So for the sake of this argument, I'm going to count it. Did you play Rift in Time, the PS5 game? The the, the new one? I'm sorry. Yeah, Rift Apart. I'm sorry, Rift in Time. <laughs> I, ha I haven't yet. I want to go back and sort of play the originals on PlayStation 2 again. But okay. after that, I will I will go back. So that's that's us talking about platformers. I do want to talk about uh, Mario a little bit before we get into the the main segment. First and foremost, you are a bit of a Mario Maker 2 savant. You <laughs> you made 100 courses over yes. two years. Uh, what was your approach to making these levels and what lessons did you take from the Mario series while designing them? Oh, man. Can I start by saying I never thought I would make 100 courses when it comes to games where you could make your own levels. I've never really done that stuff before. Even like little puzzle games like Choo Choo Rocket or something here, make a little puzzle for your friends to play. I've never even really done that stuff that much. With the Mario, I felt uniquely qualified for some reason because that their level design philosophy clicks in my brain in a way that nothing else really does. So I think my, my general approach to making courses in Mario Maker 2 was, what do I want to play? What do I want to see on here? Because I'm looking at other courses that I don't like or that I'm like, oh, this is really good. I think I pulled more from the bad examples. Of course, you know, with any game like this, you can go on and find it, you know, mi literal millions of, of bad courses. Right. So mm -hmm. I took from the bad ones. I'm like, what do I want to do? How could I have done that better? And, but that's also this is weird to admit, too. I don't think I've ever said this out loud, but I'm going to hear this is a this is a select and start exclusive when they announced Mario Maker, I think in a direct in like February, what, 2019 or something. So it was like four months before it came out. I at work between slow moments would 
start sketching stuff on paper of courses that I'd want to see ideas. I'd sketch out like, remember how like in Nintendo power, they showed like the whole level in like one long picture or something. I would start doing stuff like that and start sketching. Here's a little jump. Here's a little set piece I want to do. Here's the kind of enemies that'll be there. And I wrote like 30 of these on pieces of paper and I kept them all. I didn't really know the kind of stuff that would be in Mario Maker 2, like what kind of enemies they would allow you to make. or You know what I mean? Obviously, they're not going to have every single Mario element, but I just wrote them as is, put the ideas out there. I ended up using at least like 20 of those nice. in some form or another. There was just some, like I said, and I never had a Wii U, so I didn't have Mario Maker. I wasn't going to get on 3DS because, you know, the way the online worked. <laughs> so Mario Maker, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Mario Maker 2 was going to be it for me. And boy, I was just, I was ready. I was more ready than anybody could possibly be. I had courses made before the game came out. You you were very, very on top of doing stuff for that. And I really admire your creative spirit because I would be burnt out after four or five. I liked Mario Maker 2, but I didn't mess too much with the course creation part of it. I just genuinely enjoyed seeing what other people made and got a lot out of playing that. And that's what that's what I thought I was going to do. I thought mm-hmm. I was going to make five to ten courses max or whatever. Have I have a few courses, but I thought I was mostly going to play other people's. And I did play a lot of other people's, but I never thought I would just keep making them. But when the game when the game first came out, I was making a course a day. Practically, I'd come home from work and I just sit there for six, seven hours and bang out this thing. A lot of it, especially the early ones, is because I had no idea how the tools work. So I was just experimenting, seeing what I could do, seeing what I couldn't do. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't going to put it out until I was happy. That doesn't mean like work on it for two weeks until I have this like very perfect thing or, you know, I don't go. I didn't go overboard with it. But I was like, I'm not going to put this up until I do a run of this where everything feels 100 percent to me. And that's also I guess that was also going back to your previous question. One of my design philosophies until I feel totally good about it. I will not put it up. That was that was always my number one rule. That's great. I really appreciate you going into it because I do love people describing their creative process. And I, the way that that manifests in so many different things, I I, I genuinely admire it. I am lazy by nature, but Mm -hmm. there are things that I do love seeing through because my brain responds to certain stimuli in a certain way. I always complain how much I hate editing, but I never ever in my life half-ass it because I'm always trying to create the best experience sonically for my listeners mainly. But also I love finding little lulls and things where I could insert something or finding a little, you know, audio or visual gag that I can put in a video or a, or a podcast episode. So it's not the same thing as designing a level, but I do think the characteristics are the same where it's sort of like, you know, you have an idea, you sort of want to see that idea through and then like something new transformative emerges out of that. So yeah, that's sometimes that would happen uh, when I was working on a course, two other ideas would pop in my head. Oh, wait, maybe I can do that. I sometimes I have a problem where I try to shoehorn something into Mm -hmm. the course that's just not working and i'm like okay this isn't going to work here let me build this out on another course map and maybe i can use this idea for something else and that's how other other courses get started too because i'm like oh remember that thing that wasn't working out here let me try to build this out here that happens so much too i almost think of that as like I don't know, you know, those bands who work on like demos and song fragments and stuff like that. Well, it's like, well, not everything's going to work, but, you know, you can't mash them all together, but maybe they can become a song unto itself. That's kind of how I thought about it, I guess. Kind of, Yeah, that makes sense. So I try not to use the term over or underrated as much as possible because it's an easy way to come across as pretentious, Mm -hmm. differentiating your opinion from the masses. Art is a subjective experience. People have their own tastes. That being said, what is a Mario game that you think you like more than others? Hmm. Like, aside from, like, the general consensus, one that you think you have a greater appreciation for? That's a really good question. I think Mario Galaxy 2 Mm -hmm. is so incredible. Like, it's not that people don't like Mario Galaxy 2. Of course, people like every Mario game, right? Yeah. But... People and and Super Mario 3D All Stars a couple of years ago didn't help, right? By not having that game, they had the yeah. three others and not have Galaxy Two. I thought that was insane. Anyway, that game is so much better than the first one, and the first one I love so much. The first Mario Galaxy, I just think two is 
better in some ways that doesn't diminish the first one. It's just that people tend to think of the game as, oh, it's more galaxy. And it is, but goddamn, it is. It, I, I'm almost at a loss of words. Games that I love that much, I almost don't even know how to speak about them sometimes. And that's how I feel about Galaxy 2. I just wish people wouldn't think of it as more galaxy. It doesn't really get the standing on its own because it's if that number two, right? I guess. Yeah. And it's just using the same graphics on the same system, but I don't know, man, there's something about that game that clicks in a way that doesn't just feel like a level pack or, you know what I mean? I feel like that's a cohesive project that is so incredible. And I don't think it gets talked about in those terms because we, you know, there's Mario galaxy one, right? So Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe that would be my pick. It's galaxy two. I mean, that's a great pick. I think that, again, the, the the two part of it sort of diminishes the, the the value among certain fans. The fact that it doesn't really iterate on the story of Galaxy, which, I mean, it's a Mario game. They're not, as much as that is probably the most story-heavy one, this isn't that kind of franchise, I guess, mm-hmm. is something that we all have to come to accept. <laughs> Barely acknowledges Galaxy if it does at all. No, I think that it does, like you say, refine on the formula. It doesn't feel like a series of deleted scenes or a level pack. It does feel like a complete product and a very full one. It doesn't it doesn't skimp on the on the content whatsoever. Not at all. Yeah, it's it's just an incredible production. Just ace. even during that came out during my Nintendo, you know, off period. And I still went back and I was like, I love this game. <laughs> It's one of the few. just when you think you're out, you're back in, you know, yep. <laughs> you can you can hate them as a business, but goddamn, do they put out a product sometimes? Oh, man. Galaxy 2 was it. Yeah. So what is a Mario game that you like less than the consensus? <sighs> hmm. OK, this seems to be the easy answer is to kind of shit on Super Mario Sunshine, because I know a lot of people do. Right. Mm-hmm. And I when that game came out, I really liked it and I didn't mm-hmm. like it as much as other Mario games, but I really did. I really hated when people said it was bad or it's not. I mean, just yes, it's rushed. They had to. It's a GameCube. They had to get it out the door. I get it right. It's not all it could be, but it was really good for what it was. I changed my mind a little bit when I played Super Mario 3D All Stars. and I played I didn't get all 120 shines or whatever because I never did in the first place, but I thought a lot less of that game 20 years later than I did back then. I don't know what it was. I felt that like tight control. I thought it was not nearly as tight as I remember it. Maybe just because Mario games have gotten so refined at this point, going back to that one just feels old or whatever, but I didn't have any problem with the inertia in like Mario 64. That's like the people who played like other Mario games first and they go back to 64. They're not used to that. Like, weird i don't know uh forward momentum and stuff that mario has you know because it's a different kind of inertia and and gravity i don't think it was that there was just i don't know things that i really liked about the game before in sunshine i didn't like nearly as much whereas like my appreciation grew for mario 64 and mario galaxy even more than even higher than they already were sunshine got lowered for me somehow so maybe i guess that would be it yeah, there's definitely limitations to Sunshine that make it sort of the the least revered among a good number of Mario fans. It has defenders, like the fact that like that one has defenders in the in the in the cultural conversation and not just like dissenters instead of the general thing when it comes to mainstream Mario games. Yeah. The the structure of it is really what kind of gets to me. I understand the control issue in the um the port of it because that is a game designed specifically with the structure of the GameCube controller in mind, especially mm-hmm. how these uh, shoulder buttons work uh, with the sensitivity. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So I, I think forgot that, that about that with that being designed for such a specific system with a specific time period as well, it, it becomes easy to understand where the appreciation for that would fall. Yeah. And then there's the issue in terms of the structure of the game where you have to complete levels in their entirety generally to get more levels and you have to do a lot of completion stuff and do a lot of busy work to get to that end game. So that structure, which is sort of counter to what Mario 64 was and what 3D Mario would become afterward, I do see how people would turn against it. That did bother me during this current playthrough in Super Mario 3D All-Stars. That didn't bother me back in the day. Mm-hmm. But that is something that I did notice this time that you that you just said. There was like, oh, yeah, that's that's not great. 
Uh, because like Mario 64, there's entire levels you don't even have to go in if you don't want to. Oh, you don't like that TikTok clock? Then don't do it. You know, like you can you can get your 70 stars wherever you want. This really doles out the other levels you can do like in a weird way. And there's only seven of them instead of 15. Right. Or maybe there's only eight, I think. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot less choice in what you can do in that game. And that did bother me in this recent playthrough, whereas it did not before. And when you make it part of a pack where you have Mario 64, which was a groundbreaking changing game, especially when it was released, and then you have Mario Galaxy afterwards, which is an iteration on 3D Mario up to that point, that weird middle child syndrome is going to set in. So all those factors, I 100% get where the the value is going to decrease. I admire its level design in terms of what you say, making it an environmental world and not just a series of platforms for, mm-hmm. for a good number of levels. There are obviously those infamous uh, floodless gauntlets <laughs> that you have to go through. Right. And I used to love those and I didn't like those this time very much anymore. I used to, that was another thing that kind of fell by the wayside for me. I, I don't know. I, I, I still like some of them, but other ones were like, ah, oh, man, this one, you know, whereas I, I definitely didn't feel that way in 2002. Yeah. I mean, the obvious infamous levels that people always make fun of the, the Pachinko one, the, mm-hmm. the, the Stingray stuff that, what no sorry the lily pad one stingray thing is a galaxy level that i actually yeah. quite like uh <laughs> but the, the the lily pad level in sunshine is is untenable yeah it's it's not great i that that's not very good at all the point is like there there are some <laughs> obvious shortcomings with mario sunshine but the atmosphere and the vibes are are impeccable i cannot deny that that's why i was so happy when Super Mario Odyssey, maybe my favorite game of the last decade, brought back those sunshine ideas of having those sub levels. But every single one of those were incredible. <laughs> like I was it was a joy to find them. Whereas in Sunshine, I was like, oh, I got to do one of these. Odyssey took that idea, it just perfected it. That is probably one of the best things about that game. No, yeah, I do think that Odyssey is. The, the perfection of of a great idea the same way that people are talking about elden ring is like iterating on dark souls 2 in a way that makes it work mm-hmm. I, I feel i feel similarly about the sunshine to to mario odyssey Agenda. i had to find a way to put elden ring in there guys sorry <laughs> <laughs> well you know i just as like a complete aside it's funny hearing you guys talk about elden ring because i'm like a I'm a very old school from software person from the 90s. I used to love Kingsfield and Armored oh Core God. and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, when I was a teenager, those were like my games. It was like early 3D experiments. So like, but then, you know, as you get into the soul stuff, it's not really my kind of game. So I just kind of stop. But like, yeah, the other from software stuff before that, that was those are my jams, baby. Even Ninja Blade on 360. I used to like that one. Like, yeah. It's probably because since you played those games, you think that Dark Souls is easy because those <laughs> games are <laughs> oh, more, more esoteric and more difficult and more spiteful than anything that you'll see. And <laughs> even the famously difficult Souls games. When they announced Elden Ring, I was like, is this a sequel to Eternal Ring? Am I the only one who remembers Eternal Ring, <laughs> the PS2 launch game? And I was like, no, it has nothing to do with that. OK, fine. But that <laughs> that was my first thought, Eternal Ring. So that's how far I go back with the, the From Software, but not not lately, not really my thing, I guess, which is fine. Yeah, that th- doesn't have to be for everybody. As long as yeah. you have a healthy relationship with that idea instead of picking fights about it online every day <laughs> about how these games are terrible for everybody. Because they're not good for me. As long as as long as you have that. The discourse is crazy, man. Just man, just if you don't like it, fine. Whatever. It's okay. <laughs> so we've talked about Mario games you like more, Mario games you like less. Let's talk about Mario as sort of an intellectual property, which we'll do a bit in the actual Mario 3 segment proper, but I did want to sort of address it now. What are your thoughts on the upcoming Mario movie? Oh my god. I think this is gonna be good. I'm okay. optimistic for this. I don't know why. Maybe because Miyamoto's involved. Not that everything he touches turns to gold all the time, but I just I feel good about it. I I maybe I don't really have any like concrete reason why. It's just it's just a feeling. I think this is gonna be a good movie. Okay. Um. So like you say, you don't really have a vibe for it. My my caveat with that is Illumination as a, as an animation studio doesn't have the, the, the most incredible track record. So I'm always yeah. curious about like, why, why this company, the guys have been so, so protective about this, this, this property. As soon as the Mario movie came out, 
before then it was like if you want mario whatever we you can do whatever you want but suddenly a movie does deviate so much from the vision that the creators had for this franchise that they lock up what is this property offering is it because they will let you be more direct with it i just have questions you know it it is weird how sometimes a company will let that one thing really spook them for like years like mm. what was that movie that uh five goes west what was that disney movie that didn't do that well and they just stopped doing sequels in the, in the renaissance era i can't remember what it was walt disney pictures the rescuers down under they were like, oh, wow, we can't do we can't do that anymore. And then they just, you know, went on and made, you know, they only made the Lion King. I mean, God forbid. Right. But like, <laughs> I'm just saying that, like, yeah, that that Mario movie from 1993 spooked them in a way that's really weird, isn't it? I mean, it's been almost 30 years. So, like, I understand they want to be protective if they want to put Mario in a movie again. But, yeah, Illumination Entertainment, maybe they just thought it was like safe or cheap, maybe a combination of both. They do work cheap, <laughs> but uh, as you can tell, but like, I don't know, man, it is weird that they've been so protective, but yeah, Mario pencils, Mario trapper keepers, Mario everything. Right. But this movie, let me tell you, don't, <laughs> you know, they're very generous about Mario in terms of giving other developers a chance to play with the property that Mario and rabbits game doesn't seem like something that the Nintendo of 20 years ago would have allowed but oh that's, no that's, that's kind of a an innovation so it's kind of seemed like them like okay we are we're wading into the waters now obviously we can't be pretentious about mario anymore if we're just going to make a jillian mario parties let's let some other people take a crack at it let's let's try a movie but there is that also the chris pratt of it all yeah <laughs> the context of what is that going to be is he just somebody inhabiting the body of mario is it mario the guy himself this is a weird example because it's an ongoing cartoon or was an ongoing cartoon. They used uh, Don Cheadle as the voice of Donald Duck in the recent DuckTales cartoon mm -hmm. as a gag because Donald Duck is incomprehensible and they're like, it'd be funny if you were if you were Don Cheadle for this episode. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I know what you're saying about the Chris Pratt or, you know, like Mario's voice. But the problem is, and we all know it's true, we can't listen to Charles Martinet go wahoo for like two hours right like that that cannot be a movie i'm sorry okay. right like we can't we can't little snippets here and there are video game fine actual mario dialogue that way for for a, a movie length no right so I, what what can they do I guess Nintendo, I, I think this is maybe the only thing they could do, but it's interesting that you said the body inhabitation. I didn't really think about it from that perspective. Actually, that's yeah. a good way to play it off. Like a way of is, is this like somebody playing a video game is this a Jumanji situation. Jumanji is a hot item right now. Those movies make a, a, a an absurd amount of money considering the. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of incredible how Jumanji came roaring back to be a be a thing. I, I, I never thought I'd see Jumanji this up this high, but here we are. <laughs> And they're not bad movies. They're they're very entertaining. Yeah, they're fine. I just I just never thought Jumanji. You know what I mean? I just yeah. didn't have that on my bingo card. They're not they're not high art, but the fact that they are competent and the fact that they are huge money makers is a genuine surprise. It's very surprising. I mean, like you're not going to lose money on a rock Kevin Hart Jack Black picture. Nope. But <laughs> just the fact that it was Jumanji of all things really really sells it. Yeah, for sure. Let's just move into the proper segment itself. Oh uh, you picked Super Mario Brothers 3 to talk about on the podcast today. Mm -hmm. So let's get into it. Super Mario Bros. 3 was developed and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, it was directed by Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto, as well as Takashi Tezuka, with music composed by the GOAT himself, Koji Kondo. Best known for his work on various Mario and Zelda games, this is Kondo's second appearance in the podcast because he composed A Link to the Past. But yeah, Koji Kondo, the great. Yeah, Koji Kondo... Can I, can I actually start there for some reason? I don't know why I want to, but it just came to my head. I read an interview or something, some I don't know if it was a translated article or something from the time saying about him being so scared, not scared, maybe that's the wrong word, but feeling the pressure 
because he's like, I just wrote the most iconic video game song of all time in the Mario theme. What the hell do I do now? Right? He he actually had that thought. So he's like, well, I guess I'll just make some music, right? What what else can I do? And then, you know, the Mario 3 main overworld theme is that nice little bop and reggae number, and it's in everyone's head for the rest of time. That's all you got to do sometimes. It's funny. I mean, I keep I always make music analogies, even on fine time. But just like, you know, if you make your dark side of the moon, if you make your, you know, whatever. Right. What do you -hmm. do do next? Just keep making more records. What else are you going to do? Right. That's that's what it's the only approach you can have. And I'm glad he did, because the music in Mario three is the best. (laughs) It's terrific. It does feel like a genuine step forward. And it feels like. I mean, the whole game feels like this, just people mastering the system towards the end of its life, just a refinement of everything. It is the swan song of the NES in a lot of ways. It all it all goes together. And the idea that Koji Kondo felt insecure about it, considering how we view his music as essential and medium defining is it's, it's reassuring, actually. Yeah, he... He talks about his frets with stuff a lot. Like when Mario World was happening, he didn't know what to do with the Super Nintendo at all. He hated it at first. Like he didn't understand the sampling of it or the sound. You know what I mean? And of course, listen to the game. He got it right. (laughs) Right. But it he always has that. Oh, man, what do I do now? So it's great to hear even the greats feel that way. Yeah, I, I feel the same. Talking a bit more about the background of this game. It was released in Japan in October of 1988, but it wouldn't come out in North America until February of 1990, due in part because importing and localizing games was much more time-consuming, but also due to a shortage of ROM chips in 1988. Imagine supply lines being negatively impacted by chip shortages. Uh, I guess we're still nostalgic (laughs) for the 80s, guys. (laughs) We're here. Ronnie Reagan, I'm going to bring you back to life to put you on trial. (laughs) You have a lot to answer for, buddy. <laughs> I mean, come on. Can never Mario 3. Can I talk about that, actually? Um, Go for because it. I think one of the fascinating things about Mario 3, looking back on it, and of course, I didn't think about this way because I was, what, seven, eight years old, is that it was the first hype cycle for me for a video game was Mario 3. Because we yeah. knew this thing existed. I didn't know it was already out in Japan, but I knew mm-hmm. like this, this Mario 3 is coming. It's coming. It's coming all throughout 89. We snippets here and there, Nintendo power, little little things. Right. So it was like a perfect storm for Nintendo. Yes, they were waiting for ROM chips to become available, but it also allowed them to hype this thing up to the moon. And so when February 90 rolled around, you couldn't find that thing, man. You could not find it. We we looked everywhere. uh... Our, (laughs) Our neighbors had one. We could not get one until my birthday in May. That's that's insane. The idea that even then the supplies were just off the wall. It was a hot item after Christmas, like (laughs) in the beginning of the year, you could not find this game. That was the best birthday of all time, though, man, that May 1990, my eighth birthday when I got. Let me tell you about my mom, the MVP. Okay, okay. She the podcast is about (laughs) she we grew up in San Diego. There is a chain of stores called Playco. They're all around the they're all around the city. That's that was the store where you wanted like board games, Legos, video games, whatever, right? She camped a Playco or something. She found out when the next shipment was coming. She got me Mario 3, Mario 2, and all four Ninja Turtle action figures, Leonardo Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo Those were so hard to find, too. I remember we'd go to every Saturday afternoon, we'd go to Kmart, do a little shopping, get lunch, whatever. And I, you know, she always let me get an action figure or something. Turtles were the only thing I cared about. You could never get the turtles. I had Shredder. I had Krang. I had, like, foot soldiers and stuff. We just couldn't find the turtles. They were out, man. I don't know how she pulled this off, but she did. That was, like, the best birthday of all time. That (laughs) So shout out to my mom. Thank you. I mean, that's an incredible story. Like legitimately, that is that is so touching. The things that people will do for their kids, man, it's yeah, this justifies me making the podcast, just hearing these stories. It's not a story I tell very often for some reason, I guess maybe because I don't think of it. But yeah, it is great. Honestly, you know, you don't really mm-hmm. think about those things when you're a kid. But even though I was overjoyed at the time, I just it was it felt like Christmas times a thousand, you know? Yeah. But now looking back on it, damn, that lady must have did some work to find all that stuff. So 
thank you. But yeah, Mario 3, that's when I finally got my own copy, May 90. So I had to wait a few months, but worth the wait. Obviously, mm-hmm. we're talking about it 32 years later. Yep. I, I actually do have a note about the uh, mass marketing of this thing because they had a marketing budget of $25 million, which was massive God, for a video game. That's so much in 1988, $89, man. I did the math on it. It'd be $57 million today. Oh. That's more than double. Wow, so, man. No, it's a lot of money. And it really, the mass marketing for this thing is just super fascinating. And we'll we'll get into the detail about it. Trust me. As again, someone who went to business school, you see what they're really trying to do here is make the brand mainstream. This is not just about selling what they believe to be the best video game of all time. And probably <laughs> definitely was the best <laughs> video game of all time yeah. to that point. So, but also just making Mario a brand that's here to stay, not just Mario is the most important like character in video games. Mario is a character that is going to be everywhere. You are going to have Mario everything. It, it pays off. That is an investment where now Mario is probably the most ubiquitous public figure besides maybe Pikachu and Mickey Mouse. And like it's like Hello Kitty, Pikachu, Mickey Mouse, Mario. Those are the big four. I was going to say, is Mickey Mouse still up there? Because I don't know. We haven't seen a whole lot. Of, I mean, it's on every Disney thing, of course. I'm just saying that, like, I, f- I guess he would be. But Mario's got to be higher than that now. You know, the, the the Matt Groening philosophy of, like, a character has to be recognized as a silhouette to be truly iconic. Yeah, and that's true. Mickey Mouse is just a shape now. It's a figure. It's its, it's, its own thing. It's, yeah, it's it, more than the character now. Yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't even matter about like, oh, we haven't had a Mickey Mouse cartoon in, you know, 50 years. Well, it doesn't matter. It's Mickey Mouse is Mickey Mouse. That is ingrained in everyone's memory, passed down forever and ever. So, yeah, even if Mickey Mouse isn't a defined personality or a particularly interesting character, it's just like it represents a conglomerate, the biggest, you know, media company in the world. So it, it doesn't matter. It, it's just Mickey Mouse is it's God, basically. If we're talking about the mass marketing of Mario 3, I'm sorry, but we have to talk about the wizard. We have to talk about the. I'm sorry, but we okay. have to talk about the wizard because it is the single most shameless film ever made from a from a corporate standpoint. <laughs> it's Mac and me levels of just completely. <laughs> we have to we're, we don't have a movie. We have a toy we want to sell you and you are going to buy it because <laughs> you want it. Here's the thing about the wizard. I've never seen it. Right. Nobody at the time. When, when, you know, we get at Mario three hype was going on. We didn't. Oh, we never went to see it. We knew it was the movie that had Mario three in it. Nobody mm-hmm. I knew went to see it. It didn't do that well. The box us from what I understand, but it almost doesn't matter. Right. It was just the whoever is going to go see this, no matter how many people that is, they're going to be blown away by seeing this Mario game that doesn't exist yet. That's crazy at the time. You know what I mean? So no matter how many people that actually reached the impact of it to those people was worth it, no matter what that cost. Yeah, I don't think the movie was like a financial bomb or anything like that. It made it made money. But the the, the goal of this film was to sell copies of Mario three in the long term. Mm-hmm. So and it's so strange. It's not it's not a competent product. It's not a good movie. It's it's <laughs> I it's never I never thought it was. I I never wanted to see it at any point. I don't know, some cable station like USA or something I think used to show it sometimes or something and I always oh yeah, it's the Mario movie. But by that time it doesn't matter. It's like 1995 already. So it's like who cares? You know what Mario 3 is. That's the whole point of the movie, right? So it's like why are you showing this? So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we don't there's no product with less of a shelf life that no staying power the thing that you wanted to see this for is already out mm-hmm. it's like a when they would put demo discs for games that people did want on sort of mediocre games or how they put uh the the trailer for the phantom menace ahead of meet joe black oh, yeah. I forgot that was a thing. Yeah. Well, you just flashed me back to the one of all time. They they slapped the Final Fantasy VII demo disc in Tobol number one, right? The fight, the Akira Toriyama fighting game, which mm-hmm. like at the time I loved. That was one of those things that was like one of the biggest sh- illusion shattering things ever. I love that game. And then I played it again like 2004 and I'm like, oh, my God, this is like the absolute worst. I cannot believe I like this. But yeah, sometimes you can just get that going. You can put that demo disc and whatever. Now, of course, we don't do that anymore. But what a strategy. Mario sold. But again, the movie is just fascinating. It's a 90 minute long commercial for Nintendo products. It's not just selling you Mario 3. It's selling you the, the shitty power glove. It's, <laughs> oh it's, it's, 
That thing sucks. <laughs> I love the power glove. It's so bad. Have you ever used one? Have you ever used a power no. glove? Oh, don't. No. It's it's crap. It's as bad as advertised as people say it is. It's it's not good. The thing is like how stacked that this cast is is a thing that's been staying with me since I've done the research for this episode. Christian Slater, Bo Bridges, Fred Savage, a 13-year-old Jenny Lewis before she's the front woman of Rilo Kylie. This oh my is- god. Wow, she's in that? Okay. And there's like they, they they really believed in this product to <laughs> develop Nintendo as a brand. They weren't embarrassed by it. They were just shameless about it. Yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. it's weird. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's like I'm, I'm just thinking like imagine if someone was like so proud to be in like Ready Player One or something. If it were like a real video game based off a real video game or something like that it's like, you know, all had all the stars or something that just seems inconceivable now. Yeah. But the game finally comes out in 1990 to paint a picture of what 1990 was like in the the video game sphere. Castlevania 3, Dr. Mario, OutZone, Secret of Monkey Island, Fantasy Star 2, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) it was a time, baby. If you were not a kid in those times, it it was as wild and weird as it seems. It was it was fun. (laughs) <laughs> Meanwhile, in Japan, where Mario 3 had already been out for a year and a half, this is what they were playing. Super Mario World, F-Zero, Metal Gear 2, Final Fantasy 3, and Dragon Quest 4. In America, it's still the 80s, but in Japan, they are firmly in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, they have they have leaped ahead. That's There's only a year and a half North American time between 3 and World, right? So that's... Yeah. That's kind of weird to think about now because the Super Nintendo came out August 91. We got the one the next month. So September 91. Yeah, I didn't really think of it. It's like, oh, there's another Mario game already. Maybe because it was a new system. But like, yeah, the, the, the them pushing it off for a year and a half kind of different impact for us, I guess. Not diminished, but just different, I guess. And what a way to differentiate your product and to have. You know, the biggest NES game being Mario 3 and it looking like that. And it's not a bad looking game at all. It really mm-hmm. looks like the best of what the NES had to offer. i actually still surprised by how technologically competent, and uh, visually competent it looks like how you can make things out in a way that you couldn't with Mario 1 or even Mario 2. Yeah. But then Mario World, it's just like you are playing with new colors, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was incredible. The leap at the time was crazy. But no, Mario 3 is an incredible looking game, artistically, especially like and we were talking about what fueled like me making those Mario Maker 2 courses out of the 100 I made. I would say, I don't know, 46, 47 of them are Mario 3 tile set. Mm-hmm. So obviously, right, because it's my favorite. Those semi-solid platforms those pastels the white mm-hmm. the, the 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 blue the the pink the green whatever they may be in in whatever level they're in that just set me that just set my brain ablaze i guess of like creativity it's just like man i want to use these as much as i can i actually made a course one time where it's like because you know you have like part limits in mario maker 2 and i was like how many semi-solid platforms are they going to let me make i put them up through the entire 10 screens of the level maxed it all the way out i didn't run out oh my god i can do as many of these as i want (laughs) holy crap so i made a whole course where the entire background were semi-solid platforms so it had these pastel like weird i was really inspired by i don't know like early 80s like new romantic shit. I don't know, like, like some Duran Duran video where things would look like really angular and like colored and weird or something, or maybe like early R and B videos on like MTV or something, you know, that kind of vibe. Yeah. So I was like, what kind of like weird triangular angular shapes I can cut out these weird trapezoids in the ceiling and floor. And now like the actual Mario three doesn't look nearly that wacky as something I would make in Mario maker two. However, it does have that vibe to it. It's weird, right? Because you have the 80s, late 80s pastels and stuff. But then you also have like a lot of that late 70s, early 80s wood grain also mm-hmm. in Mario 3. It's a it seems like it'd be a clashing of eras, but it also was probably just whatever the developers were inspired by. But I think that aesthetic works in a way that's so fascinating. I think Mario 3 just purely aesthetically is incredible. 
I 100% agree with you. Again, it's super impressive that they were able to achieve that on an NES cartridge. And it holds up in a way that so many games do not. Mm -hmm. But it, it plays well and it looks good too. So kudos to the work that those developers put into making a game that still feels timeless. Mm -hmm. And their hard work paid off. Commercially, this game was a massive success, selling over 24 million copies in all of its iterations. To this day, it remains one of the best-selling video games of all time, currently holding the number 37 position. And many of those best-selling games are pack-and-bundle games or recent massive releases like mm -hmm. Minecraft or Grand Theft Auto V. So the fact that Super Mario Bros. 3 is still up there is incredibly impressive. The scale has to be considered because of what video games are now versus what they are then mm -hmm. and how certain games are sold like Wii Sports and even the original Super Mario Brothers, they just, they come with the they come with the console. This is not only an achievement in the world of video games at the time, but it firmly establishes that Mario isn't just a gimmick. It's not the thing that sells you on the console. It is something that we are going to sell you forever. Yeah, it really established it as not a fad or not a passing thing. Then it not just Mario, but Nintendo. Nintendo is here to stay. It just a success in every sense of the word, artistically, financially, as an establishment of Nintendo and Mario, just everything about Mario. 3. Yeah, for sure. So this is the best selling game that I've actually discussed on the show so far. I, I like to be weird about my research and just find figures like that. Mm -hmm. Based on my research, the closest in sales to Mario 3 that I've talked about on the show is Fallout New Vegas, which has apparently sold 12 million copies. So oh, yeah. Mario 3 sold double that <laughs> yeah a game uh, another one of my favorite games of all time fallout new vegas <laughs> yeah honestly but uh if, if we're looking purely at sales numbers as it stands on twitter would say mario 3 outsold so yep <laughs> yeah it, and the fact that again you're right like the fact that that number still holds up to today's numbers is mm -hmm. crazy talk like i think Mario Odyssey just got to like 23, you know, and it'll probably go past it. But like it just got there after five years, you know, <laughs> so like that's that's wild to think about. Yeah, those are Pokemon numbers. Those are <laughs> those are unbelievable amounts of Mario as a brand. There was a fucking TV show just about <laughs> Mario three. It was yes, called The Adventures of Super Mario Brothers three. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, I remember that one. 26 episodes. And again, it goes into that whole Nintendo used to be like, yeah, do whatever you want. It'll make us money. It's part of the image. Overall, I do think that this game is to the Mario series what A Link to the Past was for Zelda. It's not just a refinement of an established formula that pushes the series forward. It's just like innovative. It builds on the tropes established and creates new ones and makes sort of a permanent aesthetic for the series that subsequent entries would build on and another comparison point to a link to the past that i have to say is that the the fairy fountain music in zelda is the overworld music for world three so there's also that comparison oh i guess so huh you never noticed that no i usually don't make connections like that that's really interesting you're you are absolutely correct because i was a zelda kid growing up a friend of mine had an nes that we played mario 3 on all the time like it was like at a babysitter sort of thing they had an nes uh, we played a bunch of mario 3 on it and i clocked that it's like that's the zelda music what and that's so it's, wild I've, I've thought about that every time i hear it it's just like da, da, yeah you know yeah, i because i um i've made other connections especially of juni shikawa the guy who composes the kirby games uh, mm -hmm. non-kirby games i've made a couple connections oh wait a second that sounds like the other game he did from a long time ago yeah i've done a couple of those things never for koji kondo though that's weird talking about the the significance of this game for the brand of nintendo for mario as a franchise to the, the sales numbers just to talk about the significance of it in a cultural sense though i got this article from joystick remember joystick uh, from <laughs> yes this is a 2007 article that reports on the game's canon and i wanted to read a paragraph from it okay henry lowood curator of history of science and technology collections at stanford university and his four member committee have announced a game canon a list of games to be considered by the U.S. Library of Congress for Make Benefit Glorious History of Interactive Gaming Culture. This is a Borat reference. Again, this article is from 2007. Um, <laughs> Can you tell? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
The canon grew from a proposal submitted to the Library of Congress last fall and is modeled on the efforts of the National Film Preservation Board, which produces an annual list of films that are subsequently added to the National Film Registry. The registry is managed by the Library of Congress. So I point this out because it's not just like a hilariously 2007 paragraph because of the Borat reference, but because it emphasizes the significance of Super Mario 3 to people who play, develop, and write about video games. They selected 10 games in this committee, and in that 10 games, one is, you know, Super Mario 3, but the other games are Space War, Star Raiders, Zork, Tetris, hmm. SimCity, Civilization 1 and 2, the first Doom game, and Warcraft. And you'll notice that it's not Mario 1, it's not Donkey Kong, which would have been the originators of Mario 3. They picked Mario 3 specifically. Yeah. And it, oh, sorry, the, the 10th game was Sensible World of Soccer 1994. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's interesting, especially since that list is fairly PC heavy. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, so something about Mario 3 stuck out to whoever was curating this list. And that is that is interesting. And that's the thing I always it's it's what you were saying about iterating on on formula, not just iterating, but just perfecting something and innovating as at the same time, because that's the thing I always say about like Mario Odyssey when it came out and because everyone was like, well, is this the best Mario game of all time? And I'm like, yes, I, mm-hmm. I just there. Of course it is like, I OK, yeah, Mario 64, innovative, uh, groundbreaking. Mario Odyssey is better. It, it, it gets to it gets to take that foundation and do everything it needs to do with it in a way mm-hmm. that is absolutely perfect. That's what you can say about Mario three as well. It, ta- it takes those it takes that formula and it just hits every note. They knew exactly what they were doing. It's funny you mentioned the term swan song earlier because that. Yeah, they knew the SNES was coming. They knew that let's, let's, let's make that one Mario game. Right. Mm. I mean, and they know it, too. I mean, they started Mario World development of Mario World by porting Mario three to the SNES and like playing around with it. That's how the development started. I didn't know that, but that's 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 really cool. But they knew that this was a hit. They knew that this was the future of Mario. And the fact that Mario three is literally the template for the next generation of Mario games speaks Mm -hmm. to the significance of it. This is the thing that reaffirms that platformers are here to stay as a genre. It's not just that, oh, it's we are establishing Mario. We're establishing a brand. It is we have changed the video game industry. This is this is a turning point for everything. That's why it's selected by this committee. It's not just, oh, the pack in game that everybody played. This is affirmation and this is advancement. Yeah, that you're right. That is the perfect word for it. Affirmation. Just it, it is recognized. And yeah, it's not it's not Mario one. It's not any of the, it's Mario three. It, mm-hmm. it hit it hit the right notes game recognizing game um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah i think that's a pretty good list i don't have any qualms about it it's very historical and i think the only thing is that it makes mario 3 stand out more because everything else feels so the beginning mm-hmm. but mario 3 calls to mind like why not donkey kong why not mario yeah. one and we've already we've we talked it through yeah I think it's a great first draft pick in preservation, which brings us to our next segment, No Country for Old Games. <laughs> so... In earlier episodes, I'd wait until the end to do this, but since the Earthbound episode moving forward with our buddy Jared, I'm trying something new and putting it towards the middle of the show. And before we talk about what Mario 3 means to you specifically, Dre, Mm -hmm. we got to talk about the best ways to play it and how to play it. For people unfamiliar with the show's format, game preservation means a great deal to me, and I consider video games an art form. And as such, they're worthy of preservation. The Library of Congress believes that, Mario 3 in particular is an excellent game, but its value is also cultural and artistic. Mm -hmm. Its release altered the medium, and it represents the propulsion of Mario as a mainstream figure across all media, not just video games. So millions were spent to sell him. The investment resulted in one of the most recognizable characters ever. Today, we will rate this game's availability to players on a scale of A to ARG. 
and <laughs> Arg obviously. I'm 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 frustrated that games are hard to play. It has nothing to do with piracy. What are you talking about? <laughs> yada yada yada. You know yeah. what I'm. You know you mm-hmm. know you know the gimmick. Yeah. Yep. But before we talk about how well this game is being preserved by the company that developed it, I have to ask you, Dre, when it's time to replay Mario Three again, how do you play it? Nowadays, the perfect place is Nintendo Switch Online, isn't it? You can go on there and play that perfectly. It runs great. I also have an NES Classic, so I guess I could do that too. But God, Nintendo Switch Online is perfect. They load in less than a second. It's it's <laughs> it's you can play online with your friend, which I did before this podcast. I I didn't want to play Mario Three by myself. You can just I I said, hey, I'm gonna come home from work at X time. Let's play the entirety of Mario Three. Yeah, let's do it. And we played the All Stars version too, which you can also do on Nintendo Switch Online. Right. So like we did both and I hadn't played the I hadn't played Super Mario all Stars since it came out. So that right. was a trip for me to play that version again, because to me, default is like NES, just what I had. Right. So mm-hmm. I also find that interesting, just as an aside, that the Mario three throughout history, whether it's all stars, whether it's Super Mario Advance, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's Wii Virtual Console, everyone might have their particular thing. And I think that's so interesting. It could be the Mario's All-Star disc for Wii, for all I know, is how someone first played Mario 3, right? Like, yeah, that's really interesting. Because I notice a lot of people, particularly uh, early 2000s growing uppers like you, is Mario Advance for Mario 3. But you that's why I was surprised when you said you played your friend had an NES and that's how you played it. Yeah, I I had Yoshi's Island and I had Super Mario World on cartridge for my Game Boy Advance, but Mario 3 I didn't have. So my experience with Mario 3 was the original on an NES gamepad. So that's my mental association with Mario 3, but to your point, there's three different versions of the game and the the All-Stars version and the Super Mario Advance version have a completely different visual style from Super Mario 3, which you deem to be iconic. So we'll, we will talk about the All-Stars version in a second because I have a couple questions related to it in the in the main part. Okay. But let's wrap up here about the, the preservation piece. Uh, of course, this is one of the most re-released games in Nintendo's catalog, which makes sense because it's also one of their best sellers. Mm-hmm. In the past, it's been remade on the SNES in Super Mario All-Stars, like you said. This version was also ported to the Game Boy Advance as well as the Wii. The original version has also been purchasable on the Wii, 3DS, and Wii U Virtual Consoles and was pre-installed on the NES Classic Edition. Nintendo keeps it alive, so we won't dispute that, but all these methods are either dead or dying. So Nintendo no longer sells the NES Classic. They've discontinued that as of 2018. The 3DS and Wii U Virtual Consoles are shuttering as of May of 2023. So that means the only way to play this game is going to be on a Nintendo Switch Online service. And to your point, Dre, it is it's a good way to play the game. But I do not think in terms of the preservation, it is the best vessel for preservation in the long term because it is a paid subscription service. So it makes the game available. It doesn't make it ownable. It's accessible and access can be revoked. When a new console's release and the Switch is no longer supported, that game could just completely disappear. Yes, uh... That is true. However, Mm -hmm. just as far as like the best way to play it currently, you can't beat it. Yeah, it could go away. But as you went through the history there, Nintendo was always going to keep this game alive. It is in their best interest to. We're never Mm -hmm. not going to be able to play Mario 3. I have confidence in saying that. So like, yeah, they'll always find a way to make those available to us, no matter how that may be. So yeah, once once Switch shuts down or whatever, yeah, we won't want to play it this way. And I'll be sad because you can play with a friend, you know, online. And I I love that aspect of Nintendo Switch online with the classics. You know, Mm -hmm. that's how me and my friend, the same friend also got through Echo the Dolphin on on the Sega Genesis (laughs) because that game is we hate that game. And it's just like, if we're going to play it, we're going to play it together. If we're actually going to beat this. And we did. It was the worst. I don't know why we put ourselves (laughs) through that. But but yeah, once it goes away, you know, sure. But I'm also not bad about the preservation stuff, but I'm also quite a digital gamer. I don't buy physical stuff. I don't very, very often. I don't do that anymore. I'm just pure. I'm a purely digital person. So whatever's out there is whatever's out there for me. I'm just kind of beholden to it now. You know, I'm I'm a bit of a cynic by nature and do not have, (laughs) do not trust companies to always be doing what they're doing. It took until 2020 for Mario three specifically to appear on the NES, the switch online application. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of like when a new 
console does inevitably roll around. And even if it does have all the same features as the Switch, that whole process of having to start the legacy stuff all over again is just going to be so, so annoying. So yes. it's not really about, oh, Mario 3 is always going to be available. I'm kind of looking a little deeper into that bowl and trying to scrutinize the, the methods through which they roll out their library. So it's not Mario 3's fault. And Mario 3 is, like you said, always going to be available. But we just right. I recorded the Earthbound episode two nights ago. And that's such a scary, scary <laughs> game to get access to for 18 plus years. Yeah. It, it, sometimes companies do surprise us a little bit. Like when the PlayStation Plus mm-hmm. stuff went live, they honored my PlayStation 1 classics purchases from like the PSP and PS3 era. Like, remember they had like PlayStation Classics for $6.99? I had previously mm-hmm. bought like Jumping Flash and like a couple other games. Mr. Driller, I could just re-download them on PS5. Yeah. Like, they just let me do that. And I never thought that would be honored. Now, it doesn't matter. I, I did the subscription anyway, so I could just play them. But I'm just saying, even mm-hmm. if I didn't want to, that's kind of wild that Sony did that. I That was unexpected feature of it. Yeah. You know? I'll give this in favor of Sony's uh, rolling out of their legacy collection as as very as very small as that collection is. Mm-hmm. The fact that if you purchase those games on PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4, that they would carry over into the PlayStation 5. That's that's admirable. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that you can actually purchase and download the games that are on the service and not just be stuck in the, the subscription model, which is the main thing that bugs me about Switch Online is if that subscription lapses even though millions of people have that subscription and this is probably the most accessible Mario three has ever been historically. It is, it is a rental model at the end of the day. Yeah, it is. So mm-hmm. I'd rather be able to buy and download and have it, of course, like virtual console yeah. or your NES classic. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it is what it is. It's, I can't argue with the, the service itself and the, the, mm-hmm. the actual like presentation of the games. And like I said, playing them with people, it's just so good. I'll be, I will no, be sad sure. when it goes away, though. <laughs> I'm not rating in an ARG. I am. I'm not going to give it an A either. It's just right down the middle for me. So that 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 wraps up my uh, coverage of No Country for Old Games. Hmm. Now we are going to focus strictly on you, Dre, and your relationship with the game in question. Okay. Uh, in preparation for the show, you replayed the original Mario 3 as well as the All-Stars version. Is there a version that you ultimately prefer? And besides the visual component, did you find there to be any meaningful differences in the experience? I did not. I think you can have your perfect Mario 3 experience with any of the... I never played Mario 3 Advance, so I can't speak to that. I know it's based off of All-Stars, but outside of that, I don't know much about it. Yeah, I think it's just personal preference. I think I like the NES one just because of the... I think it's just the presentation of it with the colors and just like it like the the all-stars version is brighter it doesn't have that same mm-hmm. pastel look to it i know we we're trying to go outside of visuals but just just real quickly yeah like yeah. It, it like that's really appealing to me but honestly i think that's all i got because outside i guess you can save in the all-stars version you could save to battery backup that doesn't matter anymore with the way we play yeah. games digitally but that was a feature back then that would matter but mm. Other than that, no, I think you can have your, I, the, again, it might come down to, do you like Koji Kondo's compositions on the NES chip or the Super Nintendo SPC 700, right? Honestly, that's it. I don't think there's any other way to look at them. They're the same. All these are pretty good. What What is this segment? Pretzels are the same. I just wanted to know because some people are purists, but ultimately I don't think the distinctions are are that meaningful. I mean, the visual thing is really just ultimately what it's going to come down to. I prefer the the original NES Mario 3 style. It feels a lot more considered. I, I just think that there is a lot more uh, like the fact that number one, it is pushing the limits of the console gives it that historical value. Mm-hmm. But I that, that's just my perception of Mario 3 in my mind. So nostalgia. I wouldn't say that the the, the All-Stars version of the classic Mario games are plain or anything like that, but they just sort of seem normal, whereas the Mario 3 on the NES just feels distinctly like Mario 3. Yes. There's nothing else. There's no other game that looks quite like Mario 3 to me. I totally agree. And this is coming from a kid who really loved playing Super Mario All-Stars, you know, when it came out. Like, I I enjoyed seeing and. 
again, I'm old enough to have the distinction of like having played all those already. I'm not being introduced to them by all stars, of course, outside of lost levels. But like, you know, it's mm. the same. It's the same graphics as Mario one. So it doesn't matter. It was just so cool. I was like, wow, this is, you know, it really stepped it up. But it didn't replace the other ones for me, you know, hmm. so it's I do appreciate all stars, though. Yeah, of course. Uh, so normally I ask my guests what their game in particular does that they wish more video games would do. And I do want to ask that same question to you, of course, but I do have to note that this, along with the original Super Mario Brothers, are among the most influential games ever, <laughs> point blank, period. We've, yeah. we've mentioned this already. Hundreds of video games have tried to learn from this game's success, both in terms of how it markets itself and in the actual play. So I'm going to expand on this question a little bit more. So what should games learn from Mario 3? And what do you think is the secret sauce that makes it distinctly better than other platformers? I think Mario 3's biggest strength is that it's a game made for experienced players. You've played okay. Mario before. You've played other platformers before. They came into Mario 3 with the mindset of you've played these and not like an asshole way like the Lost Levels or, you know, Japanese Mario 2 because that's just prickish, right? Like this is this is true difficulty and that's something that is so hard to get right because it's so easy to cross the line. I know I've crossed the line in my Mario 2, <laughs> in my Mario Maker 2 courses. I try not to, but I know it's like, okay, that was a little too sticky. That was a little too, you know what I mean? Mario 3 nails it. It's a hard game, and as it goes on, it can be a very hard game sometimes. You'll die several times at some of these, but it's fair. It's always fair to the player. It respects the player's time that you invest into it. It's not just the difficulty, it's the fact that they built the courses around, you know what Mario can do, you know how he can jump, you know you're going to learn what these new power-ups do on the fly. You know, like I said, it's built for experienced players, whereas something like Mario World is built for beginners. They obviously built that game for maybe someone just picked up a Super Nintendo. They've never played a Mario game before, which seems impossible at that point. Right. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that Mario World is like lesser because of it. It's just two different philosophies when de designing something, something built for experienced players or something built for someone who maybe has never played Mario or any video game, really. So. I prefer the experience route, I think, with the Mario 3. That's what I take away from it. Not that every game should do that, but if you're going to make something difficult, it should be like Mario 3. I agree with you, and you do really illuminate what I appreciate about Mario 3 before, because to your point, it is not just banking on you having played Super Mario. It is basically almost impossible for you not to have played Mario 1 before, because you have to keep in mind, the first Mario game was packed in with the NES. Mm -hmm. So there was almost a 100% guarantee that you have already played Super Mario Brothers if you have an NES in your home. Yep. And with Mario World, it is a back to basics beginning because we have to make a new console. This is a new beginning, a new generation. Obviously, we're going to make a good game first and foremost, but we also have to onboard new people onto a new system who perhaps did not have the original NES. So it ties back into what we were saying about how this is the end of the NES. This is kind of like the final exam of Mario for that particular console generation before you go and move on to the new course. And it does that really well. And I, I agree with you there. I think when I was a kid, I, I was sort of wowed by the look of it. Cause like Mario super Mario world is very striking visually too. It obviously has its own thing going on. It's not just Mario three again, you know, it, it has its own thing. And I think for a long time, I liked Mario world more when when at the time but as i got older and especially when like virtual console came around i came back i was like no mario 3 is it you know what i mean i don't i don't know what i was thinking before maybe it was just like 16 bit you know oh, it's better or something i don't know what i i and then when i bought mario world on wii virtual console i'm like uh eh, yeah this isn't quite yeah mario 3 is it i don't <laughs> sorry for the last uh 10 years but yeah i i had a moment where i did think mario world is better but now that i've gotten to the age where i i know the things that i appreciate especially about now at the time was becoming retro games mm -hmm. mario 3's difficulty curve and learning factor and easing you in while not being boring you know like sometimes the first few levels of like a platformer could be kind of eh, whatever because they're trying to either teach you stuff or it's just a little too easy mario 3 doesn't do that everything about that game is interesting every single moment. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. It's always it's always throwing something at you. You're fighting for your life a lot, but it it does feel like there's a lot of expanding the design philosophy of Mario games is always like we're going to teach you something in a safe environment first and then fuck you you're on your own figure this <laughs> oh, out it's, yeah. going to keep, it's 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 a great <laughs> Mario 3 is like escalation really taken to the nth degree because Mario 1 was arcadey if you got a game over back to 1-1 one, one. but here you are game over back to the beginning of whatever world you're in mm-hmm. they can get away with being harder because of that but it also means that they can ramp up and really expand in ideas in a way that they felt limited by at the beginning. And I guess as part of it is just technology too, right? Because they had mm-hmm. the space to have a course with so many pipes and piranha plants coming at you or whatever, where they couldn't necessarily do that before, you know, because the limitations of very real space. That is one thing that if you're younger plus you don't really know much about old games that's something people often forget myself included is that you couldn't make a shovel knight back then because you literally did not have the space for it you yeah. know you could never make a game like that with so much music and so much you know like so but now we can do these super duper 8 bit games right but yeah. mario 3 tried to do that at the time you know, they tried to make the best super duper 8 bit game they possibly could. Of course, they succeeded. So, mm-hmm. yeah, no, they make something that's visually rich, something that just feels dense while you're playing it. And it is the first Mario game to introduce overworlds, which becomes a serious staple moving forward. And I can honestly say that I think that Mario 3 has the best overworlds in the series, barring like some visually pretty stuff in 3D world, but just the idea of how your character on the screen interacts with that world. Uh, finding those secret passages, going on a boat and moving that boat and finding a a secret behind where you were supposed to originally hide, you know, ride that boat. There's just like a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, there's a lot of hidden stuff. Me and my friend, I remember, I'll never forget this. We were playing Mario 3 and the first time we had the coin ship show up. You know what I'm talking about? Like the pirate ship full of coins that Mm -hmm. can appear randomly if you have some certain parameters in your score. I forget what the parameters are now. We just triggered it somehow. We were like, What is that? Blew us the fuck away. Oh, my God. There's just there's full of coins. Why I can't get them all. It's scrolling. You know, like we were like, holy shit. You know, that was one of my biggest like when I was a kid. Holy shit moments while playing a video game because we just we had no idea that was there. It's not like we read about that Nintendo Power or something beforehand or how to trigger it. I mean, we figured it out later, of course. But when the game first came out, we were like, whoa you know that sense of discovery is so important to mario like little secrets whether you stumble across them or even if you know about them and try to trigger them it's still cool yeah this is a game that invites the player to also sort of push themselves and find the limits of what the developers put in there and i I appreciate that symbiotic relationship between player and developer you can see that relationship forming here yeah just a, it's a great game. It's a great game. I can't, I can't, I can't dump on it. It's hard to, yeah. I, I was trying to, I was really trying to scrutinize it when I went back to play it in preparation for this. And it's just like, it, it's, it's really refined. It's, it's really good. I could maybe just uh, the tiniest nitpick. Mm-hmm. Like, no, the way, hold on, hold on. Let's, 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 let's do it this oh. way. Cause this is always a question I ask. Okay. Uh, the question's always sacrilegious. <laughs> I, I invite my guests onto the show to talk about the games they love the most. And I have them kill their darlings. I have to ask this to you, of course, too. What is something you wish the game did better? Okay. Just one (laughs) thing. The tiniest thing. I'm sorry, Mario 3. I love you. Maybe a few too many boom boom encounters. There's a lot of boom boom in Mario 3. The big fish, right? No, the the guy at the end of Fortresses. You have to stomp on him three times and then... uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. Way too yeah. many of them. Way yeah. too many of them. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of boom, boom. And this is coming from somebody who in Mario Maker 2, I spam boom, boom. He's just decoration in my courses sometimes. I, I did a ghost house where all you do is like kill boom, boom, like uh, mousetrap style. I don't know if you know what mousetrap is, the, the board game where you, I don't yeah. know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made contraptions to kill boom, boom, because I was just sick that way. <laughs> I love Boom Boom. There's a little too much Boom Boom in Mario 3. Boom Boom's my buddy, but there, there's way too many of him. It's Again, it's a limitation. They can't develop at so many unique enemies, but you're just like, all right, it's a mid-castle. Here comes fucking Boom Boom. And <laughs> Yep. And once you find the rhythm for him, he doesn't ever really get truly harder. They try and mix it up with the level design in the room and mm-hmm. him getting wings later on. But if you know the pattern, you're, you're set. You never have to question it because it's jump. Wait a second. Jump. Wait a second. It's it's every single time, no matter what. 
I, I remember the first time I don't remember the first time I saw the wings, but it freaked the fuck out of me. I was like, oh, my God, he's flying. He's flying. You know what I mean? I just I had no idea that was going to happen. But yeah, even if he even if it's one of the boom booms that have wings, you can just stomp him out before he can even have a chance. So, yeah, just a little too much boom boom because the game does a good job teaching you the pattern of boom boom. And then like after that, the problem is like, you know, and you know what to do. Yeah. I'm honestly trying to think of another flaw here, and I I cannot. I really cannot. It, so, me- I mean, this is a nitpick if I can offer one, and it's just the number of rising water levels that come up throughout the game. It is a little too much for me. The big, <laughs> it, this is a personal taste thing. It's like it's something that actually started from Jack and Daxter. Big fish freak me out in video games. And the, the big cheap cheap is just like it, it, it's, it's, it's too much. Me too, buddy. I hate that stuff. I I actually don't like fish in real life. Like stuff in the sea really freak me out. So Mm -hmm. like in a video game form where it can like eat you. No, thanks, man. Even just like the bloop, you know, the bloopers who like charge up the little bloopers behind him and send them out in a wave pattern or whatever. Even those I don't get away from me. Disgusting. But yeah, that the, the rising water up and down, at least it's only a few levels, but sure. Yeah, and he just gulped. Even if you're wearing a frog suit, that thing doesn't care about you. It'll just eat you. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's pretty instant. If you get into the water in those levels, you 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 are basically guaranteed to be eaten by the big cheap cheap. Uh, but again, personal nitpick based on like a personal like getting eaten by the big fish and Jack and Daxter a lot that that sort of created that. That again, that's really nitpicking because there's so much that I love about this game that's introduced in the franchise from here. My favorite thing in any Mario game, of course, being sliding down a hill and just knocking people the fuck out yep you know what's great also about the level design is that they made sure you couldn't just spam the leaf and just fly wherever you want there you had to have a runway right and to design all the levels to make sure that you just can't do that wherever you damn well please is kind of ingenious really yeah they definitely like give you levels where you're able to do that so you can get the power realization to do so but it's not commonplace you're always going to have to be jumping pretty quickly or avoiding something or ducking Mm -hmm. Uh, which brings me to the next question that i had for you is what is your favorite power up in this game Ooh, i gotta go hammer brothers suit it's kind of a rare one right but yeah it's very rare yeah i've always loved that thing and it's just so it's so good i actually when i played the game on the all-stars version in preparation for this I actually beat Bowser with the Hammer Brothers shoot. I didn't know you could do that. Hmm. I mean, think about it. This game is over 30 years old. I discovered something I didn't know before. I played it a million times. I had no idea you could kill him that way. So, like, I just thought you always had to, like, let him fall into the, the lava or the pit below by breaking the bricks. But no, I killed him with that. Have you ever tried that? Like, I, I swear I didn't know that. So. No, I mean, like, I've not. this is probably the Mario game that I've beaten the least just because I I, I played World way too much. Uh-huh. I was one of those guys, those booger-eating Mario World players. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I didn't know. I mean, I know that in a lot of the Mario games, the fireballs will do it. But mm-hmm. it's, it's cool that the Hammer Brothers suit can do it because, again, they, they really have to use every single line of code that they can to... <laughs> make this game work and mm-hmm. the fact that they also put a contingency in there if you have the hammer brother suit it, it it'll work yeah go yeah. go go for it i wanted to save peach in the hammer brother suit but it's just regular old super mario when you go in the door oh no but <laughs> <laughs> at least you figured something out about the game that's that's yeah. cool which I, brings me to another point which is like how cool the inventory system is in mario 3 yes. and how more of the mario game should have used that, that making an inventory management system in mario cool <laughs> That was revolutionary. Like, I don't use that term that often, but I I really mean it. That was absolutely revolutionary for a platformer Mm -hmm. to have that. That was crazy. I mean, even Mario World didn't do that, right? Because they wanted to simplify the thing, you know, for for beginners, not worry about this menu that you got to dig through. It's so useful too. like, yeah, I don't use every item in the book for every run or whatever, but like you use them often and you get so many of them often. So you're incentivized. I don't know if you're one of those gamers where it's like, well, I got to save all my elixirs for the last boss or something in a a Final Fantasy or whatever. Sorry if you are. I didn't mean to call you out, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah, you, it incent- Mario 3 incentivizes you to use that stuff instead of saving it, which is great because the game's so hard. You got to use that stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, you have to use it, and you have a very, very limited amount of space to use it. You only have but so much space, and you're going to run into those bonus rooms a bunch. And it's kind of a and once you're out of the world, you're out of the world. You're moving on. You're you're not you're, you can't just save them for later. <laughs> mm-hmm. for too long. The cool thing is like they have a good balance of things that you can use in the overworld to benefit you, things that you can use in the level itself. So you have like the Lakitu cloud in the overworld if you want to skip over something. They have the the music box to put the Hammer Brothers to sleep. If in which I definitely use this playthrough because there's that one area in I think world four or something where it's just like three of them were surrounding me and I felt like God like I finally feel like I was mastering the game this time (laughs) once you get near the castle there's like a there's a bunch and I'm like no that's that's enough I I I cannot Mm -hmm. fight another um I forget what the big hammer brothers are called the big boys I always just call them big boys I forget what their actual name is but yeah (laughs) big boys yeah yep (laughs) But like that, that's a great world too, the giant world or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. They don't do that enough in the Mario series and 3 does it and it's awesome. Yeah, like some nowadays it feels like, and I don't mean this to mean like, people like to shit on New Super Mario Brothers and I don't. I actually do like the New Super Mario Brothers series. Like, outside of New Super Mario Brothers 2 for 3DS, I think that's awful. The other three, I actually, I do like. But there was that one in New Super Mario Brothers U where it looked like a Van Gogh painting. There was that one stage that looked all crazy. Yeah. And it, yeah, and everyone was like, whoa, this is so cool. And I'm like, it's cool, but it sucks that this stands out so much in this game because it's the one visually very interesting thing that they did, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's kind of like, yeah, it's cool, but it's also like, eh, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I mean, I think the really main criticism of the new super Mario brothers formula is just how normal it all looks. Like I use that term for all stars. It it definitely applies to new super Mario brothers. It's novel Mm -hmm. when you do it on DS because it's like, Oh, cool. 3d ish models that you use in the mario space it feels modern and then you yeah. do it on wii and it's like oh cool they, they put a little sheen and polish on it but then you like it just keeps coming mm-hmm. and they don't really change the art style or evolve it and that's when the fatigue sets in <laughs> yeah at least new super mario this you had a different overworld theme instead of the other ones even though it was very similar but yeah i bring that up just to say that like mario 3 at every turn they try to visually pop something at you the best they mm-hmm. can that's one thing actually about the differences between the original and all stars is that in world 8 when you start getting to the like the quote-unquote regular levels on the map instead of just like the tanks or whatever there's mm-hmm. that one level on nes it's like i think it's like eight two the ones where you could sink into the sand it's all like ghosty and white it's like black and white it's so striking and weird and kind of spooky on all star so it's like colored in the sand is you know brown or you know like it doesn't look the same you know what i mean it doesn't give you that vibe like oh that's that goes to your point about mario 3 just being really special in nes because they really tried to make everything look as unique as they could with six megabytes or whatever they had right yeah i mean this is Something that I've noticed a lot with uh, games that get like visual remakes in any kind of way is that the limitations serve the style. And when you go and upgrade that, that kind of charm and deliberate choice kind of goes away. And this is especially true when you're like upgrading something from like the Nintendo 64 PlayStation 1 generation upwards. So like there's a lot of scary stuff in the Ocarina of Time Majora's Mask originals that kind of lose something when it's not as polygonal and weird and abstract when you will play them on the 3ds remakes and i yes I, I still like i said majora's mask is my favorite game and i just think the, the the remake loses a lot of the stuff and i do think that visual upgrade is a big part of that yeah like in mario 64 like diving down da- and dire dire docks the big eel that's mm-hmm. so freaky to me because one i hate stuff in the sea as i said but like and it's huge and it looks kind of polygonal and jank right that's part of the scariness because it looks like uncanny valley yeah yeah it's weird oh i'm very i'm very uncanny valley sensitive honestly so like (laughs) that that is part of it too so yeah it just it freaks you out but if they did like a mario 64 remake it'll just look like a big eel that's realistic which is great but it also won't like it won't hit the same way I mean, so Mario Odyssey, they have those giant eels in one of the beach levels, I think. Mm. And it doesn't it doesn't do anything to me the same way because it's not this massive. I mean, it's still a massive eel, but the idea that this is like scary and flat faced and just triangular that that lends <laughs> itself to the spookiness. Absolutely. So, yeah, the point being like that the striking imagery of the the limited NES palette versus something looking clean in the SNES, I, I 100% empathize with it. 
Yeah, I didn't. I never used to understand that stuff. Um, typically, I'm like, ah, whatever, you know, but like as I, I don't know, in my old age, I've gotten grumpier or something. But like because now I look at that stuff and I totally agree. We are seeing it now in movies, too, because the CGI vacation of things that we once understood as practical effects, whether that's like seeing Spider-Man's visual style change and evolve to be more CGI and less mm-hmm. practical or anything like that. It's just like the cleanliness and sheen and polish is kind of just dehumanizes and remove something from it no i agree like one of my real quick one of my favorite movies is total Mm -hmm. recall and that's like at the very beginning of like them starting to use cg there's that scene where he's walking through the airport and they show a skeleton like walking through because they're doing the x-ray that's actually cg it's the only cg in the whole movie Mm -hmm. and it's so striking because it's like whoa how did they do that now i know how they did that but, yeah. you know, back then they might even before CG, they would have to probably do some weird stop motion thing, you know, like they did in like Robocop 2 or I don't know, which is also 1990. So it was weird. But like, I don't know. Yeah, th- those effects now, it just you're right. Practical plus CG. It's just I don't know. Oh, difficulty. We've talked about the difficulty of this a little bit. You call this an experienced person's Mario game. Mm-hmm. It's banking on the fact that it is not the first Mario game you've played. It is Mario 3 after all. In the franchise's overall difficulty on the, we'll just call them the mainline Mario games, where would you rank this difficulty-wise, and what would you say is harder than it otherwise? I think this might be the top. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of something that may be harder. I I try not to count Lost Levels slash Japanese Mario 2 just because it's so out of control. That's that's, that's its own thing. That's its own thing. Yeah, yeah. It's so trolly and weird. I... I did talk about how you in my Mario courses, I did try to do that experience player thing. I assume you know the move set of whatever style I'm using, Mario 3 or otherwise. And I assume you know how to use every aspect of whatever power up I give you or whatever, right? That's that goes along with the experienced level design philosophy that I followed when I made those. But mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to count this, but like Remember they did like a Luigi version of New Super Mario Brothers U? I forget. I don't know if the name is as simple as like New Super Luigi U maybe or something it's, like that. I think that's that is it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually it's included on the Switch version. Yeah. Yes. I that's a version I have. I did enjoy those levels and they were pretty tough. Like mm-hmm. I did enjoy that I side I don't know if you want to call it a side game or whatever, but that might be the only thing I would say is harder than Mario 3. I don't think anything else gets up there. Like, do you agree? Like I don't I, uh, so I think there's a lot of check for mastery stuff in Super Mario 64 specifically. And Sunshine obviously has, I would more categorize it as bullshit stages. <laughs> but I mean, like, I think if you're really getting down to it, I do think if, if you're looking at the side scrolling stuff, I do think three is the hardest. Mario 64 is tough if you want to get all the stars. You, it is tough. Yes. It is not easy, especially if you want to get 100 coins on TikTok clock or something. Oh, my yeah. God right it's, there's, it's there's definitely hard. a lot of mastery level stuff there's mm-hmm. the there's a the stuff that's like so you can only get all the stars if you're great at it but you can beat the game and only be okay at it mm-hmm. yeah so three it, you're kind of your three is linear you have to be good at it. <laughs> yeah you can't p wing everything that's another thing they accounted for it's like we're gonna give you the p wing but some of these things are gonna have ceilings and blocks where you're you're not gonna be able to do that right so you yeah. you can't just fly over everything if you want to so they accounted for it there's the underwater levels too, and the, the 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 dungeon underground stuff too. So there's there's never a power up that can easily get you through every situation. Yeah, the P wing is a blessing though. If you really don't feel like doing something, I will P wing quite a few like of the tank levels in World Eight. Cause I'm like, you know what? I just I can't. I don't want to today. <laughs> yeah. No. I think that I think we can call this one the more difficult one. Yeah, I think so. Again, like it, we're not talking about loss levels because that's that's specifically designed to be hard. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like this is the point, you know, Nintendo hard being the name of the, the trope or whatever you want to call <laughs> it, where to account for the fact that these games were shorter, they had to make them harder. You can't advance if you aren't good at it, but you also don't get kicked all the way back at the beginning like you're playing Mario one. If something was easy, though, back then, that was kind of considered often a detriment because you did want to master something. That was the way it was. That's the way it was, you know, and that's why, like, Super Mario 3, while not being 
I don't know, blaster master or something that you really have to nail down and like either memorize or just really get super, super good at. It does have that perfect difficulty where it's like, oh, you don't have to be like super blistering hard. But, you know, this is this is it. Mario three. It gives you a lot of leeway if you know how to time the the little roulette thing at the bottom right where you get <laughs> five level ups if you get all three stars. I'm so and, bad at it. Yeah, I've, I've always been bad at it. I get a great groove at it because the trick is like you just get the running out of the pipe. And if you get like a out of the pipe run jump, you'll always get the star every time as long as you just like immediately out of the pipe run. I got like three of them in a row and I'm like, that has never happened before. But like I said, I think I finally started to truly understand this game. This this go around. I did discover that and I do get it sometimes, but just sometimes I... I don't know. I mess it up or I just like I have the frog suit on so you can't get the momentum or I don't know, like something always seems to happen to me where it eludes me. I did get one uh, big fireworks star, though, the other day when I was playing on all stars. I was proud of myself. Oh, yeah. Are you good at the um, the sliding puzzle where you have to line up the mushroom flower star? Because I'm bad at that, too. I, I no, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it once and then I think, oh, I figured it out. I mastered it. And then like next time I'll fucking fail. <laughs> so no, <laughs> I can never get the star, man. Sometimes I can get the flower and I'm like super proud of myself. But mm-hmm. yeah, other than that, nope. Yeah. One more thing about the difficulty. The last time I played this game uh, before this replayed it for this uh, round, I was playing it at calls with a friend. We're doing the two player thing and we were just being driven up a wall once we got the cloud world. Like we could not beat cloud world whatsoever. <laughs> and it wasn't helping because we, we played games well into the night and it's 3 a.m. And we're just like pacing around the room. Like I can't fucking do this anymore, man. Mm-hmm. This is <laughs> this game's <laughs> insane. And then we just like threw on Super Mario World and then we, we, beat, we beat that pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot easier. Not that Super Mario World is easy by any means, but it is a lot easier. I want to say, though, about that sky, uh, you know, You know, you start on the ground, then you have to go up the tower, then you go into the clouds. Mm -hmm. You know, that tower is one of my favorite, like, thematically placed things, like, in a video game, probably ever. Especially since, like, it doesn't work like another fortress or anything. It's a fortress music, and it kind of plays like one, but it looks so cool. You're in a castle of bricks. Mm -hmm. You're going up to you're going up and up. You realize that you take that Mm -hmm. final beanstalk up to the last pipe and then it's over. Then you're in the sky. You're in the clouds. And it's like, whoa, you know, and I I remember doing that for even when I did it just now last week, it still had that effect on me. Like, this is so fucking cool. Like, I it's one of my favorite things in a game, period. No, it's great. I love it. I like you, you said it so beautifully. I don't have it. I don't have anything to add there. (laughs) And again, <laughs> like, like, the only thing is the only thing I can say is like, you know, it's they did this on the NES cartridge. Just so impressive. We've talked about how influential Mario 3 was on the video game industry, but ultimately the point of this podcast is to talk about the impact these games had on their players. How do you think this game has impacted you and your taste in other media, other video games, etc.? Mario 3, I think, was one of the first games to get me to think about game design because I thought it was smart. Even though I was young, I was like, I just felt this game was elevated somehow above whatever else I was playing, not just because it was so good overall, but because... I, I felt the game was smart, as I said. I, you know, wow, I didn't expect that to be there. Oh, this world, you can, everything's big. Whatever it may be at the time that impressed me, it made a permanent impression on me. And, and like the artistic value of it didn't come around till later. I didn't really think that way at the time. Obviously, I was too young, but God, it did, it did something to me. I'll tell you what, I think that's what I take away the most, just the artistic and just the elevation of it. I felt like it was just smarter than everybody else on the NES, that game, that Mario 3. That's really well put. I think the thing with good game design is that it's practically invisible. That's why it's always harder to compliment things than it is to complain about things because mm-hmm. when something is great, it it's just organically a part of it. It's seamless. But when something is bad, it immediately sticks out. And that's what makes Mario 3 so great. It it doesn't have those like extraneous bits that really just 
pick at you in a way that even the best games have. How lean Mario 3 is, is it's strength. It's a virtue. Mm -hmm. There's not too much of it for it to become overbearing and it's not too long. So it doesn't become cumbersome or overwhelming at any point. Like it, it definitely becomes difficult. It definitely becomes challenging, but it never becomes insurmountable. No. And that's what keeps you coming back. It never feels like, like I said, about experience difficulty without crossing the line. You mentioned Cuphead earlier. I think Cuphead crosses the line a little bit sometimes. I like Cuphead sure. a lot overall, but sometimes I felt really upset because something felt very untelegraphed to me or I didn't know that was going to happen or, you know, stuff like that. I You played the game. You know what I'm talking about. But like. I never feel that way with Mario three. And like I said, every game's going to slip up. There's never mm-hmm. going to be any game where it's going to be like, okay, that felt totally fair. I really don't think there's a moment in Mario three where I felt like, okay, come on. I, if there is one, I don't know of it. I can't think of one either. And that's what really pissed me off about the sky level was because it's like, it's really just my lack of skill here. I can't argue anything else about it. When mm-hmm. my friend and I, we same friend played cuphead all the way through. We are like, come up. Fuck on, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's readable if you look at it, but there's there's so many moving parts and it's so busy on the screen that it takes you a while to really adjust. And failure is part of the experience. But mm-hmm. with Mario, it really comes down to skill checks and your your proficiency at controlling the character. That's what really hurts. You do it to yourself, as Radiohead said. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I love that song, by the way. Uh, going back to like the, the the I felt the game was smart. Is that just is just one example of many things in the game. But in world six, the ice world, Mm -hmm. there's a, you know, sometimes in the game they'll let you choose. Okay. Do you want to go to level three or four? Do you want to go to five or six or whatever? There's one part in the ice thing where I think it's level six, six, six. You have to have a leaf and you have to grab a Koopa Troopa in its shell and you have to fly up to the ceiling and use it to break some bricks all in like one go before the Koopa Troopa wakes up and you lose your leaf or whatever. It's Mm -hmm. really tough to do. And your reward for that is getting a toad house and you can go on your merry way. You don't have to do that at all. You can do the other one, level (laughs) five, and just play a totally different level. But like you said, a skill check for those who want it, but it's optional. That was something that was new to me, too, at the time. Stuff being optional. Everything before that was just completely linear. You play all the levels or whatever or don't or you're stuck. This was like. If you get stuck on one of those things, okay, I'll try the other one. That was very new. Yeah, I mean, like you think about what alternate paths meant before and what alternate paths mean after, and it's a completely different thing. There's varying ways of approaching a single level. That Those are the advancements. It's not just, oh, you're playing a game. You are experiencing something, and you're not playing the same exact game every time necessarily. Not at all. So we've talked about how this game has influenced you and your taste on things what media would you recommend whether it's a game a book show movie or otherwise to people who like mario 3 or just something you'd recommend to get a better sense of your taste that is an excellent question okay i have something i don't know how much this has to do with mario 3 but i think it's an example of smart game design and visual serving it and all of that stuff It's an indie game from a few years ago. It's called Ape Out. Have you ever heard of this or played it? Oh, my God. That might be. I said Mercenary Kings might be my favorite indie game of all time. This has got to be maybe it one and one A or maybe just number two. Ape Out hits every note literally because it plays like what would you call it? Procedurally generated as you do the stuff like the jazz music also Mm -hmm. like hits, you know, you're a gorilla. If you don't know what this game is, you're just splattering fools all over the place. It's super violent. And while frantic jazz music plays, it is one of the best like audiovisual experiences I've ever had in my life. That game is incredible. And then you have the artistic side where everything actually looks like a jazz record from the 50s. Mm-hmm. Like they look like album jackets and covers like you're playing the album is like the whole stage concept. Mm-hmm. If, if you if you've listened to this whole thing and you've heard what I like about level design uh, and you want it in, you know, something of a more modern context, play ape out that game set my brain on fire. I'm glad you know what game I'm talking about, because most people look at me like what? But yes, <laughs> it's been on my wish list, but now I might just have to bite the bullet on it and get on on switch because it I mean, 
you, you sold me on it. That's that's really great. It's incredible, man. Just so incredible. Yeah. Any any other recommendations you'd have uh, or anything that ties back into Mario 3 for you or just, you know, just something you'd recommend yourself as Dre? Oh, man. Oh, I have something. Okay. I I was one of the kids, like I, I said earlier, I got a Super Nintendo in, soon after it came out, like September 91. So like those like late NES era games i pretty much ignored i'm like i have a super nintendo now bitch i'm not forget i get this h bit shit out of here i'm not doing that so like i missed a lot a lot of games but one game i went back and played that i'm really glad i did it's a game by taito it's called panic restaurant it's a platformer Mm -hmm. it's exactly what it kind of sounds like you're just this you're this chef you're this dude you have a frying pan as a weapon you're just kicking the ass of like these rotisserie chickens that are coming after you and like all sorts of weird stuff. It's a it's one of those weird um, late era NES games that don't get a whole lot of recognition or maybe it does nowadays. I have no idea what's resurfaced, but like if you want to post like NES Mario platform, no, it's not Mario 3, right? But I think it is so unique and fun. And so like if you want something from the era that's on NES that I consider that I think very, very highly of, it would be Panic Restaurant. Good to know. I appreciate your recommendations. I usually recommend a million things on this podcast. I only come to you today with two. Mario 3 speaks for itself. Its influence is everywhere. It, it's influenced platformers for generations and will continue to do so, whether people are conscious of it or not. I will recommend to you one platformer today, the indie game Celeste. Uh, it is definitely hard. It is definitely challenging, but it is a game that really, really explores that idea of a game being difficult and challenging and integrates it into its story and really makes it a part of the the interactivity it's so well made the music is incredible and the way that it's difficult isn't kind of in the way where it's like oh i died at the end of the level and i have to start all over again it's like you have to get through this screen everything is one moment at a time everything's one screen at a time you will die countless times it is inevitable that you will die but you will not fail you will not fail as long as you keep trying and that's what i really admire about this game is that it takes that challenging part of platformers but it doesn't make it impossible it makes it feel achievable and it always makes you keep going and that really ties into the themes of the game so i heartily endorse celeste if you are looking for a platformer game it's hard to recommend games with Mar- after mario 3 because it's so much a part of everything but i do think celeste really really engages with the idea of difficulty in video games in a platforming space in a way that is truly great yeah i would co-sign that i loved celeste and i don't usually like games like that and i i did Mm -hmm. like celeste a lot a lot of indie games can get tiresome but this has just the right amount of everything to really make it work again it's that lean aspect that makes mario 3 great it doesn't have too much of anything it doesn't have too little of something it's just right i agree Hotline Miami is another game I'd recommend. It's not a platformer by any means whatsoever, but it is another game that really engages the player on a difficulty level, but it also makes you feel compelled to try again because it is short bursts. Uh, It is also like what we were talking about where an experience isn't the same thing every time. Uh, You can different approaches to the same challenge in Hotline Miami until you get it. It's it's super fun. It's super violent. The music is kick ass. I'd like it's it's worth it just to listen to the music alone. I I much prefer the first game to Hotline Miami 2, which just feels like a little bit too much, which kind of makes Hotline Miami 1 even better because I do think it has that balance that is necessary in these kinds of games. So, yeah, please please play Hotline Miami. Hotline Miami 2 is good too, but Hotline Miami 1 is where it's at. I I, I couldn't agree more. I love Hotline Miami. Yeah, and that's going to do it for my recommendations. I wanted to keep it simple because this is a simple game, but that is the beauty of it. Let's read some user comments. These were comments that were submitted to me via Twitter after I asked people for their opinions on Super Mario Brothers 3. Chris, aka at Chris Salvin, shared this really sweet story that I wanted to read. My mom loved to watch me play this game and be second when I was around five years old. When I was around 13, she wanted to play through with me again. I accepted and proceeded to use the warp whistles to beat the game in a few hours. I didn't realize she just wanted to spend time together. I just wanted to show off my game knowledge. I had no ill attentions. I was oblivious. I still think about this enough where it gnaws at my brain. Sorry about that, Palm. I gotta play through with her again one day. Anyway, it's a great game. Giant Land fucking rocks. I agree, Giant Land is great, but I don't think you disappointed your mom as much as you think you did. She was just trying to have a good time with you, yes, but 
you at least got to show how much this game meant to you to the point that you were great at it, and I hope that you can at least get some comfort from that. I hope that you get to play with her again soon though. At Reincarnate, aka Unleashed Bimblar, said, It's the best 2D Mario game, just great platforming and level design with some killer tunes. Also, the fact that you can store items to use on specific levels is so cool. I agree, I think it's one of Koji Kondo's best scores, and the item inventory system is great. Ben, aka at Ben Your Hero, said, Consoles peaked with the SNES, but console games peaked with Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES. Literally the greatest game of all time. It's a great game. Really appreciate your sentiment. Thank you all for writing in. And that's going to do it today for Select and Start. I really enjoyed this episode, Dre. It was really great talking to you. I was worried about what. how much can we talk about Mario 3? It feels so big, but yeah. also so simple. But we, we really got a lot to talk about with it. And you're really easy to talk to. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Please talk a little bit about Fine Time and where people can find you after the show. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. I loved being here and talking Mario 3, and you're right. I'm glad we, you know, God, I guess we can talk about Mario 3 forever at this rate. But yeah, I yeah. do a podcast called Fine Time with my two friends, Steve and Kevin. The It's it's about video games. Sometimes we might talk movies or music or occasionally, you know what I mean? But it's video games, old stuff, new stuff, basically whatever we're playing at that moment. That's what we want to talk about. And we talk about some current events and we play little games, too, at the end. Like, I don't know anything about Pokemon, nothing. So Steve loves to make up Pokemon names and we play Pokemon real or fake. I guess if that's an actual Pokemon or not, we do weird stuff like that. Really, the theme of the show is three guys talking shit. So it's just, you know, it's a, it's one of the, you know, sit around, talk shit with your friends uh, say what you like, what you don't like, your hot takes, whatever, you know, just let it fly. Basically we're loose. We're fun. Have a fine time with us. I always feel cheesy saying that. I was, I always feel compelled to say something cheesy with fine time, but there it is. I really like your podcast genuinely because I listen to a lot of video game podcasts and a lot of them feel encumbered by their format. Like they have to stick to one lane when talking about something and approaching something, but you guys do not have a dedicated format. You guys put the hobby before you put the the show. And that really, really shows in how you are able to appreciate the medium in a way where you don't have to compromise yourself to do it. And I really admire that. <laughs> the, the show is really good. The, you guys are a lot of fun to listen to. Like, it really feels like I'm just listening to friends riff. And I mean, you are my friend, Dre, of course. But like, <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just nice to like hear people talk about games and shoot the shit and have a good time talking about a hobby that they're all really into. And it, again, speaks to that Mario 3 thing of just... Not not throwing too many things in the air, just having the right amount of stuff. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm glad you like the show, and I hope anyone who's listening who hasn't listened to Fine Time checks it out and likes it as well. And again, you are also Pizza Dinosaur on Twitter. You can follow him there. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else that you want to plug or promote before I do the outro? That's about all I got. No, I'm P I'm Pizza Dinosaur on Twitter. See me on Twitter. <laughs> now, this is Dre, aka Pizza Dinosaur. Please listen to Fine Time after you listen to my show, of course. And that is going to do it today for Select and Start. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Once again, I am your host, editor, and promoter, Kiefer. If you enjoyed this episode, please give the show a positive review wherever you're listening to this. Engagement helps the show, and your feedback will improve it. And if you want to get more engaged, give the show a follow on Twitter, at SelectPodStart. If you have any thoughts about Mario 3 or any other games we've discussed, send a DM or leave a comment, and I will gladly read it on the show. You can support me on Patreon as well. If you pledge at least $1 a month, you will get early access to new episodes as well as extended episodes with exclusive content. You can also follow me on Twitter at Danny Vegito and find links to the rest of my projects in the description of this episode. The art for the show is made by my best friend, Avery Ott. You can follow him on social media with the handle at Avery Robin Ott. That's A-V-R-Y Robin O-T-T. -T. You can check out the links in the description for his work as well as Dre's. All right, I think that's it. Y'all have a great evening and have a fine time. I love the power glove. It's so bad.